Thank you, Chairman. I can confirm that you are now live on YouTube. Right. Uh Right, everybody? Right. Uh, good morning. I'd like to thank members, officers and members of the public for attending today's meeting of the Planning Committee. And the first thing I'm going to do is conduct a roll call to check councillors who are present at the meeting, please. Wendy, if you'd like to do the roll call, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Councillor Bones sends his apologies. Councillor Bauer. Present. Councillor Bubb. Present. Councillor Diwali. Present. Councillor Holmes. Present. Councillor Howland. Present. Councillor Hudson. Present. Councillor Lawton. Present. Councillor Manning. Present. Councillor Knuckles. Present. Councillor Parrish. Present. Councillor Mrs. Spikings. Present. Councillor Story. Present. Councillor Tyler. Present. Councillor Whitby. Present. And substitutes, we have Councillor Long for Councillor Crofts. Present. Uh, Councillor Rose for Councillor Patel. Present. Councillor Rives, substitute for Councillor Rust. And I'd like to thank, thank those, that have, those that have stepped in uh, for people who can't attend. Thank you for coming and stepping in. Um, I'd like to remind members that this meeting is being recorded and streamed live via YouTube and that it will still be recording during break breaks. Because of the acoustics in the town hall, please only turn your microphone on when it is your turn to speak and turn off when finished. And members, please do not leave the meeting during an item, otherwise you will, and when you return, unless that's finished, otherwise you will not be able to take part in the debate or vote on that, ma on that matter. So we've had item one, that's apologies. Item two, the minutes. Are we happy to the minutes confirmed as a true record on the 3rd of April, 2023? Agreed. Agreed. Right, I'll sign in a second. Declarations of interest, members, please. Any declarations? No. Chairman, Sorry, Councillor Chairman, Chairman, Story. Morning. Just to say that there's one or two applications regarding um, North County Council, um, yes. which I'm a member of, and I don't. I just let the committee know that that's a fact. And if uh, if I sort of wander off the straight and now, I'm sure the legal section will put me right. Thank you. Right, and the same with Councillor Long. Thank you. Right. So we've done declarations. We now move on to four urgent business understanding order seven. I don't have any today. Item five, members attending understanding order 34. I have Councillor Kemp and Councillor George Joyce for page 118. Item six, chairman's correspondence. Any I've had, which I've had several, I've read and passed to the relevant officers for their deliberations. And seven, receipt of late correspondence on applications. Are we happy to receive this, members? Agreed. Item eight, note the index. And then we go on to page nine, which is the first one. And these are majors, so speakers will have five minutes. It's Hunstanton stroke Old Hunstanton, and it's a development of 61 housing with care apartments, etc. It's a full application and the recommendation is approved and there is late and speakers. Thank you. And we also, to add to it as well, have Carl Patterson from housing here should we need to ask anything of him. Thank you, right. Tash, over to you. Yes, hello, good morning. So this application is, sorry, couldn't move through. <clears throat> so this application is for um, 160 dwellings comprising 61 housing with care apartments which are in, in this location of the site. If I just explain the site first. So it's um, to the east of Kingsland Road in Hunstanton. A better map is in your agenda that shows the, the wider location of the site. Um, it forms part of the two allocations within the, the local plan, one for employment and one for housing with care. So as previously stated, the application is for 160 dwellings comprising 61 housing with care apartments that are located in a three-storey building here in the, the bottom of the site. Um, we have 39 care-ready bungalows, which are located uh, adjacent to the care apartments and then 60 residential um, dwellings. This is together with community facilities contained within the apartment building, um, cafe, hairdressers, etc. 
Um, Off-site highway improvement works are proposed. Um, so we have the access here, which is to the west of the site onto Kings Lynn Road. And just north of that, um, I have got a better plan that I will show you shortly. Um, there is a toucan crossing, um, widening in a footpath along here to the toucan crossing and also a island in the central access area to the community uh, to the commercial park that lies to the north of the site. Um, the site's not within a conservation area, but there are a number of listed buildings and scheduled monuments in the locality, notably Smithton High School and gym to the north, Redgate Water Tower to the southwest, and the Chapel of St Andrews to the southeast. The site lies within flood zone one, it's not within, but it is in close proximity to the North Norfolk area of outstanding natural beauty. The issues are as listed on page 10 of the agenda. The application is before committee with a recommendation of approval, subject to a section 106 agreement securing affordable housing, which is in excess of policy requirements, policy requirements being 20%. There's 50% um, proposed on this site. Um, open space provision, maintenance of suds and provision thereof, and GI RAMS, which is Green Infrastructure and Recreation Avoidance Measurement Strategy. It's been called in by Councillor Bill, and there is late correspondence and speakers. So if we just go through the plans, this plan shows um, proposed materials. It shows the, the roof colour is the internal colour, and the brick colour is the external line colour. So it's a mixture of, of buff bricks, red bricks, um, red roofs and, and grey roofs. This shows the different types of, of boundary treatments um, across the site. This shows the, the elevations of the um, three-storey care apartment block, which is actually in a, in a T shape. So you can see from here, these are the, the floor plans. This is the ground floor plan. It shows the area of the hairdressing salon and cafe, as well as obviously the rooms and other plant services. We've got some examples here of house types. I'm not going to show you them all because there are, there are a number. This shows the um, affordable flats that are proposed at... Um, Plots. I'll just show you on a plan where those plots Excuse are. Excuse me, I'd like all these houses shown, please. Oh, you haven't got them? No, but I would. I mean, we've got them on uniform, but there's just... All right, yeah. Yeah, we'll come back. Yeah, well, I, I have shown a selection of the different house types. So, for example, if I was to show you a, a standard four-bed detached, you would just get very similar iterations of, of the right. same. So I have tried to give you a cross section of of the different types so these are are the flats so four properties at ground floor and four at first floor this is an example of an affordable bungo, bungalow this is a chalet style bungalow and just another type of bungalow this is an example of a pair of semis two bed semis this is an example of a three bed semi um, this is an example of a three bed detached this is an example of a four bed detached. This is an example of a, a larger four bed detached and then the, the largest of all the, the proposed dwellings. These are um, just showing the different garage types. Um, whilst I appreciate this isn't very clear um, because of the scale, this shows the access into the site. And then as we move up here, we then drop down to, to this plan here, which shows the position of the Toucan Crossing, and it shows an island in the, the centre of the access to the commercial park, and this allows people to, to cross to the central island and, and then carry on. And here we have some of the photos. So this is a view looking north. So this is just north of the um, Red Gate roundabout. And this is the application site. Again, this is a closer view north and you, you can actually just make out the, the commercial park and the, the mast 
that's located within the commercial park. This is from the western side of the site, looking north again, like I say, you can see the commercial park. And this is just a 360 really of, of the site, which as you can see is an agricultural field with, with hedge planting. <laughs> this is a view of the commercial park, which lies to the north. And from this view, looking further north, you can just see Smithton High School um, through the commercial park. This is a view from the commercial park looking towards the site itself, and you can see Redgate Tower there. Again, looking north. Again, of the, the site itself showing the agricultural field and the furthest boundary. This is from the um, access to the commercial site. So the access to the site itself would be in this location here. And now we're looking in the other direction. This is um, a photo taken from the opposite side of the road. It shows Smithton playing fields with the site itself um, and the commercial unit. You can't see the buildings, they are in that location there. So we have some photo montages. Um, this is before we have had amendments to, to this scheme. There are slight amendments which are reducing some of these um, joining. Um, roofs if, if you like so if we go back to that quickly i can just show you that the difference is that they have now been some reductions so we've got some lower areas and um a, a zinc a zinc and glass connection which was uh, requested to reduce the overall mass um as, as far as possible of that element This is a view from the commercial site towards the, the apartment building. And these are some photo montages from Smithton High School itself. Um, we have included this, this picture from Smithton High School because what you'll see is that there is quite an expanse of site that's here that um, isn't actually included in the photo montages. They, they kind of stop really. Uh, where the, the tree line stops, but there is actually um, a further element. Um, and this shows the relationship of Smithton High School with the surrounding open agricultural mm -hmm. landscape. That's it, thank you. Thank you, we'll now start with the speakers, please. I have Paul Rawlinson first, please. Oh, yes. Yeah, hello. Can He's you hear on me? Zoom. Yep, on Zoom. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can't see you on there. You can hear me, did you say? Yes, yes, I can hear you. OK, thank you. Uh, thanks for letting me speak on behalf of Heachin Parish Council, who object to this development. Um, whilst the development is outside the area of Heachin and therefore the requirements of the Heachin neighbourhood plan, it, it is within the area of Hunt Stanton's neighbourhood plan. And there is commonality between them. As a major development, of course, this impacts much further afield than just on Stanton. Both neighbourhood plans expect high quality highway provision. The access to this development is via a single junction onto the major road. In the past, highways have objected to developments exi exiting directly onto major roads. When queried, Norfolk Highway's response was that officers had changed. And this just seems crazy. It's it's almost as if it can't be acceptable. There needs to be consistency in highway safety through good, strong policy decisions and planning. If not, highways could end up as the weak link in development. Policy 14 of the Hunt Stanton Neighbourhood Plan also says that new developments or new dwellings, including flats and masonets, will require to include car park into minimum standards. Hunt Stanton is a very rural area, 16 miles from the nearest major town, and it currently has very limited public transport links. Proposals for development not meeting these parking standards will not be supported. The very large apartment complex with 61 care apartments appears to only have about 30 spaces for residents, and that includes employees and visitors. That's less than half of what is needed under the neighbourhood plan. That's the uh, on Stanton neighbourhood plan. It's been emphasised during the planning process that this is not a care home. Therefore, it's likely that the, the elderly 
residents um, or in fact visiting families will have cars or some form of transport. The outcome of limited parking is that elderly residents could end up isolated from friends and family and from being able to go shopping. We, we know that loneliness is a big problem in this country and we need to provide opportunity for mobility for the elderly. And that really means adequate parking. Policy 17 of Hunstatton's Neighbourhood Plan says development proposals in the, in the defined separation zone will not undermine the visual separation of Hunstanton from Heacham or Old Hunstanton or the views or settings of the uh, area of natural beauty. Any development should not result in the coalescence of Hunstanton with Heacham or Old Hunstanton. Map 17 on page 35 of the Hunstanton Neighbourhood Plan shows that this leaves a very small separation zone for Heacham and infringes into old Hunstanton's area. This is against the spirit of both neighbourhood plans and is disappointed that Hunstantoners are effectively ignoring this requirement in their plan and therefore seem happy to impact on Heacham and old Hunstanton zones. This policy was placed in both plans to maintain the specific identity of these areas, separate towns and villages. We don't want to end up coalescing into a single entity. Flooding and water quality is always on our mind, and this development could impact on the poor coastal water quality in both Heacham and Hunstanton. Through, though Anglia water is not openly admitted to an issue, there has been topping out of the sewage at Heacham Sewage Works. Whilst it's a design matter, we would seek assurance that this is not going to exacerbate the current problems. Hunstanton doesn't have its own sewage treatment, and there is significant risk that Heacham's plant that is clearly running near capacity may be impacted um, by this development. To conclude, it's clear that with parking, buffering, road safety and sewage capacity issues, a number of elements do not appear to have been properly considered in this. And in particular, we consider that neighbourhood plans have not been given proper consideration in designing this and other sites, and that risks undermining and trivialising them. These are spatial plans that should not be brushed over. Therefore, I urge you to consider that despite the need for housing, this site and this design still needs further work before it's approved. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm going to have Ian Hill next, please. So much. Yeah, I know, but I've got others yet at the bottom. Yeah. Because we can win that, we have to do it. Yeah. Mr. Hill, thank you. Good morning, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, my name is Ian Hill from Bidwells, and I'm here this morning on behalf of Lovell and Lovell Later Living, who are seeking to bring forward this scheme. The report provided by your officer, as well as today's presentation, have been very comprehensive. Accordingly, I do not wish to repeat many of the issues that are already been covered. However, I would like to briefly highlight the following points. The proposal seeks to deliver a high quality, sustainable landscape led development that will meet an identified local need on land, on land allocated for residential and care related development within both the adopted and emerging local plan. As members have heard, outline consent was previously granted on the site for housing and care related development back in 2017. The proposed development can be split into three components, housing with care, care ready bungalows, and what may be termed general needs, general housing. Paula Broadbent, Managing Director of Love or Lady Living, will be speaking after me and will provide further detail on the nature and need for the housing with care and the care ready bungalows. With regards to the general housing, this will be brought forward by Lovell. Lovell have a proven track record of delivering high quality developments in Norfolk and the local area, and are keen to ensure that this development respects and reflects the distinct character and qualities of Hunstanton. The proposals before you have been arrived at following extensive consultation, and the applicant has taken time to ensure that the comments raised by consultees have, where possible, been fully addressed. For example, as we've heard, the layout and design have been subject to lengthy discussions with the case officer, the council's conservation and design officer, to ensure the creation of a sustainable development that creates a strong, strong, vibrant and healthy community. A central element of the layout is a large area of public open space in the site, which is fronted by housing. The provision of open space across the site exceeds policy and includes provision for children's play space. A circular walking route is also provided as part of the development. 
whilst the development of any greenfield site for housing will inevitably result in a change to the appearance of the site and the surrounding area, a comprehensive landscaping scheme will be delivered, which includes the retention enhancement of established hedgerow, as well as the planting of landscape buffer on the north, eastern and southern boundary, ensuring that the impact of the development on the wider landscape is minimised. The development will provide 50% affordable housing across the whole site, well in excess of policy. This figure includes the care element of the scheme. The affordable provision reflects discussions with Council's Housing and Aiding Officer, who again, as we've heard, supports the scheme on the basis that it reflects a local need. In addition, and in accordance with policy, the Housing and Care Apartments will be used for primary residences. There are no objections from Anglia Water or the LLFA. The highway and access strategy for the site is supported by Norfolk County Council, which, is also, which also approved the access as part of the outline consent back in 2017. A two-can crossing point is to be provided as well as a cycle path along Kings Lynn Road and will provide safe access for residents to the services and facilities within Hunstanton. To conclude, the proposal seeks to deliver a sustainable high quality development for which there is an identified local need on a site allocated in the adopted and emerging local plan. The scheme will deliver both environmental and economic benefits, including the creation of approximately 60 jobs. The proposals will be brought forward by a developer with a proven track record of local delivery. In light of the above, I hope you feel you're able to endorse the recommendation of your officers and support the proposal. Thank you for your time. Thank you for coming. Uh, could I have Paula Broadbent next, please? Good morning, and thank you for inviting me to come along and speak. Um, I've been in post with Lovell for the last two years, and prior to that, I've worked 30 years within the field of commissioning, managing, and developing specialist housing for older people. In March 2022, Norfolk County Council published research to evidence the need for specialist and accessible housing for older people across Norfolk. Each district worked closely with researchers to identify demand, planning, and viability issues to inform local plans. The proposed development will deliver extra care and age-exclusive housing for affordable rent, shared ownership and market sale in response to identified local need. Extra care schemes provide a very important social dimension to the white whole community by enabling local people to use shared facilities and access services focused on well-being in later life. The demand for Kings Lynn North, which includes Hunstanton, predicts between 2020 and 2041, the number of homes required will increase from 527 to 906, and that by 2036, there is demand for 133 affordable rent, 192 shared ownership, and 243 for sale, extra care and age-exclusive homes. The specialist scheme we propose supports better outcomes for local people, fitting the health and social care policy being promoted through the North Yorkshire County Council Promoting Independence Programme, combining self-contained apartments and care-ready bungalows with access to 24-7 domiciliary care and support services and communal facilities. Specialist housing is essential to early intervention and preventing older people in being admitted into institutional care and it is pivotal in sustaining health and social care services. Extra care housing allows people to live securely in a home of their own with their own front door. Retaining independence because of the ease of access to facilities and services which keep people physically and mentally well for much longer. Our partners, places for people living plus who will own and operate the scheme, are experienced in the delivery of extra care housing and believe as we do that it is vital to create the right environment for people to live and age well in the communities in which they choose to live. They and other registered providers have evidence to show people who move into extra care housing often experience improved health, mobility and cognitive function very soon after moving in. And this improvement is sustained right up until end of life. And the same is often witnessed in those older and more vulnerable people living in the wider community. Care services will be provided by RADIS, an experienced and well-regarded provider of health and social care services nationally. Over 50 staff work in a range of roles, 
and shift patterns will be employed in the scheme 24 hours, 365 days a year to respond to both planned care and in an emergency, alongside over 15 housing, catering, domestic and maintenance roles. Radis can provide the same care services to residents living in the extra care and care ready bungalows and offer people of Hunstanton locally based quality care and support services. The specialist housing services and facilities are designed to work together in harmony, wrapping around those most vulnerable residents to create a safe, secure and engaging environment, offering a true sense of belonging in the community. The common, common, common health facilities are essential components of extra care housing because they promote access to good nutrition and hydration and social interaction, which the whole community will benefit. We believe it is essential to create a community within a community, environment for all the people to thrive alongside families, combining, combating lo loneliness, which is one of the biggest killers in old age and preventing incidents in the home through the delivery of accessible care ready homes is what we are committed to delivering through our lifelong design standards. We believe everyone is an individual and our products and services ensure choice, security, control for people as they journey through later life. We believe this development will stand as a flagship to influence others across the county to follow and assist the council to improve opportunities for local people in perpetuity. We are committed to ensuring these homes are occupied by local people as their permanent home, and our partners are committed to continuing working closely with local health and social care services to ensure the scheme and services reduce the pressure on local NHS and social care. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> right. <laughs> Could I please have Mike Rustin, please, and Stanton Town Council. That's an addition that came in late. And then I've got to read out, or oh, Wendy is uh, a letter out by Councillor Beale. Good morning, and thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm Deputy Chairman of Hunt Stanton Town Council Planning Committee, and we support this application and would like to see it approved, please. We've supported this idea ever since this piece of land was first allocated for development. In February 17, as you know, your then planning committee approved a similar application and we supported that one too. On that occasion, Heacham Parish Council did not object. This is a far better proposal than earlier ones and schemes that have been mooted since in that there are 20 affordable houses and bungalows plus 61 apartments that are affordable, and buyers of those that are for sale have ownership and can resell. We need complexes like this for older people who may then free up their homes for younger families to occupy. Heacham Parish Council now object on three grounds, four actually, if you include the criticism of our neighborhood plan. <laughs> Single access onto the A149, Highways don't object. Reduction in separation between the two parishes. Heacham didn't object in 2016, 2017. Sewage capacity. Okay, Anglia Water continually say their plant is adequate whilst using tankers to take away the excess. They didn't object either. As for the comments about Hans Stanton ignoring our neighborhood plan, our understanding is neighborhood plans be are to be taken into account and are not necessarily cast in stone. Your officers recommend approval of this application and we very much hope that you will. Thank you very much for hearing. Thank you very much for coming. Um, Wendy, if you'd just like to read the latest piece. And Thank you, Chairman. This is from Councillor Paul Beale. Good morning, planning committee. My apologies for not attending today as I have a medical appointment. The reason for calling this in was for two specific reasons. Firstly, the A149 gets extremely busy in the summer months, especially from the entrance to the town roundabout along to past the Glebe School. And when on a sunny weekend, cars are stacked up down the hill towards Heacham. Residents have talked to me a lot about this problem and building on your site. 
is not going to help the situation. So I'm pro proposing on behalf of Hunstanton residents is not to have an entrance and exit onto the A149, but a spur road coming off the roundabout just before the development. My second reason is sewage. We are not achieving the blue flag, which Hunstanton was always proud of, and it is fact that sewage is being pumped into our seas. A lot of new building is going on at the moment, and town people feel the infrastructure will collapse when they which they feel will be very harmful to the town. I must stress that I am not against new development as our town would benefit from the sill, but if the infrastructure does collapse, it would spell disaster for the town. Thank you for your time, Councillor Paul Beale, Hunstanton Ward, thank you. Thank you. Um, Tash, anything to add, please? Yeah, um, if I can, I'll, I'll just talk about Heacham Parish Council's um, comments. So in relation to the single junction, um, every application has to be taken on its own merits. And the, the Highway Authority consider this is wholly acceptable in all regards, safety and congestion. In relation to, to parking standards, um, there are parking standards within Hunstanton Neighbourhood Plan, um, and they are Decision should be taken um, in accordance with the development plan unless there are material considerations. Now, in relation to the care apartments, um, county standards are actually actually require a third of the parking spaces for care apartments. Um, so that is reduced by by a third. Now, we would consider that is a material consideration. Um, and consider it acceptable in this instance that it would go con contrary to what Hunstanton neighbourhood plan would normally require for, for a dwelling. Policy 17 was referred to, and this is the separation zone. However, the separation zone is outside of this allocation. So this allocation, which is an allocation in the development plan, is actually not within Hunstanton separation zone. So it does accord with, with that policy. In relation to Anglian Water comments, it's not actually true that Anglian Water um, say they have capacity. They've made it quite clear, and it's in late correspondence, that they know there isn't capacity. However, they have an obligation once planning permission, planning permission is granted, or if planning permission is granted, to increase capacity. So um, they have acknowledged that there is an issue, but they are obliged and they've stated that they will ensure there is capacity if planning permission is, is granted. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Um, right, I've got first of all, Councillor Bauer, then Councillor Long. Um, yeah, I've got Councillor Bauer first. As the present um, Ward Councillor for Hunstanton, I 100% support this application. It is very much needed. 50% affordable housing, we need that. We need a sustainable location. All the landscaping and this site has been very carefully thought out to give minimal harm to anything in the vicinity. And it's been very carefully planned over a long time. The shared ownership, affordable housing, this is all plus. This is for local people in perpetuity, and it's what we need. We need people to be able to stay in the area that they've lived and be cared for, stay near their families. And we also need affordable housing for our youngsters. I think the comments on the road, I actually can see where they're coming from, but I think this can be sorted. And I actually wouldn't, it, when I read through this, I was really, really excited and pleased for Hans Stanton. Thank you. Thank you. I've got Councillor Long next. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. It's one of those, one of these ones that for absolutely years, you know, there's been a need for this kind of care, uh, housing with care type facility in West Norfolk. I remember several years ago going to visit the uh, care village at Bothall and was 
thought that you know this is something that we need in West Norfolk. So they 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 cover quite a big footprint. You then have to say, well, where do they need to be? But actually, they need to be somewhere where people want to go to. You know, people people want to go into this type of facility. Actually, as as was said, to to, to free up uh, um, their existing. Um, house house dwelling um, for, for other families that might need it. But the fact that all the facilities are on site does make for a much better living experience. And I could, my mum, old mum would have liked to have moved to somewhere like that in preference to uh, a, a care home in her later years. I'm sure she would have. Um, so then we get back to things like highways and, and sewage, uh, et cetera. Well, every single extra dwelling is an extra demand on the sewage system. There's been lots and lots of media coverage about um, um, output from sewage treatment facilities. If they don't put the output through them on times when we have deluges of rain and water, then everybody in Hunstanton, Heacham and everywhere else wouldn't be able to flush their toilets. So there's a, there's a uh, um, we, we covered this at uh, scrutiny committee at the county council and had Anglian Water there. They've got plans for how they improve Many of their sites, including uh, some natural uh, uh, facilities, obviously some are too close to, you know, uh, the, uh, you know, a sea wall, if you like, to be able to do. But in the case of uh, most, they're looking to improve the situation. And of course, they have to add capacity as customer demand um, requires it. After all, they charge not just for the water that they uh, that they supply, but also for the foul that they take away. The other thing that I would just say about the highways issue here, um, the fact that the road is busy and is often stationary because of the roundabout just a bit further up and so on, actually makes it easier to get in and out of a junction. I mean, this morning there was a problem on the A47 and I pulled out of the A47 from, from the village of my road directly out on the A47, far easier with the traffic not moving than when it's doing 60 miles an hour. And so if the road is busy, actually getting in and out won't be a, a problem. I absolutely can't see why there's objections to this. And I find it strange that a neighbouring parish uh, can make representation uh, when the actual town council has made their deliberations and input. And I think we should take weight on that and not what's been said from elsewhere. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Councillor Hudson. I've got you down. Um, I am concerned about the, the amount of traffic on that road, considering we are all, have already had the question uh, further down the road uh, uh, for the arc. That's going to be coming in into, the, into that same road, the 149. We have going to have more than ever traffic on that road and I think it is going to become a much more dangerous road. I know the care home is needed um, and we do need affordable housing in Stanton but in and among that there's a lot of houses that are just for sale and those houses are second homes. So we've got to look at this site as a whole we do need some of it. We need the care homes. We need afford affordable homes. But do we need to build all these houses to have another, another input of second homes and holiday homes? Uh, I think this could be a much smaller place if we didn't build for investment. Thank you. I'm just going to come back on your comment because I think um, we need some clarification because my understanding, these are for local people in perpetuity. Yeah. Is that right? Uh, Could you answer? No, not all of them. Oh, no, or so, not. I'm just, just yeah, making sure. sure. So the affordable housing will obviously be um, restricted to, as principal use and also yeah. so will the bungalows, the care-ready bungalows, and will be restricted to principal use. And um, so they can't be second homes or holiday lets. Right, that makes that clear. Um, Councillor Bubb next, please. Thank you. Um, as chair of the Climate Change Working Group, I think I ought to be inquiring as to how the three-storey block is going to be heated. And if it's from one central <coughs> boiler room, for want of a better term, 
Could this not be a neighbourhood heating scheme for the whole development, rather than having 40 plus air source heat pumps whizzing away, causing a, a, a noise which we are concerned about by condition, uh, it'd be much more efficient to have one heat source for the whole site. You've got the opportunity of doing it because it's a green field site. You can start from scratch. These heating schemes do work. Um, they, they are scattered about the country. And it's a particularly famous one at Dolphin Square in London was heated by Battersea Power Station's excess heat. Mm -hmm. uh, and that went under the tent. This is so simple by comparison. But if you have got all these air source heat pumps, which make quite a lot of noise en masse, uh, a nice Saturday, sunny afternoon sitting in the garden you've got this hum all around you and they're not terribly reliable they do leak the gas so you have to maintain them they require fan motors from time to time they only last three or four years before the bearings wear out i, I know this from my previous experience in refrigeration um it's not the ideal it's a good system but it's not the ideal system when you've got the chance to start from scratch with a proper neighborhood heating scheme Right, we'll come back to you on that one. That's not a, that's not as part of this application. It's not it's not put forward. Um, so you've got to take this application on its on its merits. Obviously, it's got to meet building regulations now, which are much more stringent than they used to be. So yes, it probably will have air source heat pumps to, to, to do that, which is most most new houses have. So yeah, you can't single out this development just 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 for for that. Did you wish Can to come, come back, back on that? Yes, it, you you are sufficiently worried to condition. The, the, the noise output of these things, that let's possibly just give some small consideration to getting rid of that noise altogether. Pretty standard that we do, when you're dealing with air source heat pumps, that you do that. Um, yeah, so, so that's why we've done it. Not, not because it's a specific, you know, special case uh, for this application. Right, Councillor Diwali. Thank you, Chair. I've, uh, yeah, I've got a long list here, forgive me. Um, first of all, just a note that I see this is on Grade 3 agricultural land, and it's deemed that the development outweighs the need for food production. We might want to hold that in our heads uh, I'm later. sorry, I'm going to stop you there, because this is already an allocated site, and it's Understand. gone through all the processes. Yes. Uh, no, may I continue? With the yeah. Yeah. We'll Thank get you. it straight as we go. Oh, I understand that this is um, allocated land. Um, it is quite interesting, um, certainly with the heritage aspects that got through the inspector. However, um, continuing, um, I am concerned about um, air quality uh, with regard for the schools, both Glebe and Smithton, um, given uh, the concerns about the added uh, traffic on the A149. Um, I'm concerned about active transport uh it's not clear how the two community crossing ties up with ingress and egress from the site because the two maps seem to be um, separate from each other so i want to make sure that it is it is the most accessible site for uh, the development and that there's easy access into the town for pedestrians uh, such as um, to the church and other facilities. Um, the, um, the buses um, are of a concern. Um, people have um, expressed concerns. So where is the nearest bus stop? And is there a likelihood of a bus route actually circulating the uh, development? Um, I'm also concerned about the police report which doesn't seem to have been uh, fully addressed which is um, which is contrary to the supporting statement uh, which says that they want um, the housing is intentionally placed to outward face and encourage use of the wide range of facilities and services by the local community families friends and informal carers um, and the reduction of socialized isolation and North constabulary seems to be a little bit more concerned about the vulnerability of residents. Um, that also comes back to concerns about um, uh, de no dedicated cycle paths. It doesn't seem to be clear on the plans whether these cycle paths are dedicated. I assume they're not from the report because again, you have vulnerable pedestrians. Um, so I do ask of that one. And finally, in mitigation, there is meant to be an open, mm. an area of open grassland created 
off-site. Um, I don't know where that off-site is, could it perhaps be to the east of the school um, so that the children can benefit uh, and the school can benefit uh, from the, uh, the loss of uh, view uh, to the countryside as a consequence of the development. Um, I think those are the key points. Thank you very much. Tash, if you want to come back with those answers. Or... Yeah, sure. So you can just about see on this on the smaller the smaller plan. So this is the access into the site, and this is the proposed toucan <laughs> crossing. Um, so that leads, I think it's Collingwood, Collingwood Lane to the to the west, um, which does you decent footpaths, decent lighting all the way into the, the town centre. Um, in relation to, to bus routes, there is a bus stop. Um, I think it is shown on here, but it's too small to read, but there is a bus stop. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry, Stuart's put, pulled it up. There is a bus stop in absolute close proximity to the, to the site. There will be no circulation route of buses within in the site, no. Um, the, in relation to the police comments, so the, the police um, really are there in an advisory role um, to highlight key issues, but also they, they seek to get what's called secure by design um, for developments. However, there is no actual necessity for developments to meet that standard. Notwithstanding that, um, most of the police comments have been, have been addressed. Um, in relation to off-site green space, there, there is no off-site green space. Um, the red line site boundary is wholly contains all of the development, including, um, as has been previously stated, um, an over-provision of, of green space, including what was required by, by Natural England, which is the these walking routes around the, the periphery of the site. Sorry. That's okay. Uh, yeah, that's right. I think he's saying time's up. <laughs> right. Could I have Councillor Parish next, please? Then I've got Councillor Raj. Thank you, sir. I've got you down, I've just said. Well, I've got no um, objection to the concept. and I've not got much objection to the location. However, two things. A lot of words have been banded about about local and in perpetuity and so on. Um, in fact, the care um, apartments and so on um, may be in perpetuity for West Norfolk, but they're not for Hunstanton and District. It could be that absolutely nobody from Hunstanton and District actually gets a place in these care homes. It depends where they are in the list. So my concern and the concern of my residents, and I do take into account my residents, unlike apparently Hunstanton Town Council, because I listened to their neighbourhood plan and I listened to what they said. And their concern is the impact on local health services. And by local, they mean the health services of Heacham and Hunstanton and the neighbouring abutting areas. If you have an influx of people from outside the immediate area, it will have an impact, a negative impact on local health services. What I would like to see is a condition which not necessarily restricts, but prioritises people from Constanton and the immediately neighbouring areas. They get first bite of the cherry. They can fill up these places. If the space is left, then it can be open to a wider audience. That would not have an impact on the local health services, the local being the ones where the development is located. So that's the first thing. Could I just ask you then, how long a tenure will they have to have lived in Hunstanton for this to be? We've had this discussion before about the um, development on the car park, which took three planning committees mm -hmm. to decide that there'd be a condition. Now, I think it was something like three to five years or something like right. that. Is that what you're adding in that condition? That's what I'd like. Yes. Right. So I'm now going to ask, is this fair, reasonable and deliverable as a condition? Stuart, I'm, I'm finished talking. I'm going to take it as you go because you might come on with some other right. things. All right. Yeah. Um. There, there's no policy requirement. Um. To, to, to tie that condition to, so it wouldn't be reasonable. Um. For. This is covering a wide area. This is a facility that's going to be, and again, Carl will come in no doubt on housing. Much needed facility, certainly in that area. There's a lot, you know, obviously aging population. Not just in Hunstanton, but across that, the village surrounding villages and that north, you know, sort of north coast and wider 
areas. <coughs> I'll join it out to that. Yes. So, oh. yeah, so, so affordable housing will generally be um, allocated based on need. Uh, and this would obviously um, go contrary to that um, if it's going purely being primarily based on um, local connection. Um, and that, that's the same for any um, new affordable housing other than rural exception sites where um, the permission is only granted on the basis of that local need. In this case, this is a, a standard allocation. And um, so the housing would be allocated um, based on the council's allocations policy in accordance with need. Right, council the parish. So that. it's been confirmed that it won't necessarily serve any local need in the context of Hong Stanton and surrounding area. And I didn't say just Hong Stanton. I said immediately abutting areas as well. There's 5,000 people in Hong Stanton. There's 5,000 in Peachum. That's 10,000 people. There's 3,000 down the road in Dursing and so on. You could have absolutely nobody in these premises, in this facility from those immediate areas and there'll be additional pressure on the local health services. That's the first thing. Next, and I do, we haven't got a policy on it, but we didn't have a policy on the car park um, development in Hunstanton either. We changed the policy in order to get the thing through planning committee. So we can change the policy again for this. Now, the next thing is um, access. Highways have a policy not to have large developments like this straight onto a main road. It's their policy. Just down the road at the Hopkins Home Developments, which came through 2016, they had to put in new roads and a new roundabout in order to access that development. Suddenly, this one can be accessed from a single junction onto the A149. It's ludicrous. And there is a simple alternative, which was proposed by Councillor Beal, which is his concern. You've got the Red Gates Hill roundabout abutting this development. There could be a slip road from it to this development, and it would remove all the highway problems associated with a single junction on the A149. Why they haven't done that, who knows? But it's certainly not common sense, it's certainly not sensible, and it's certainly what should have been done. Now, I just have to finish by um, addressing some of the snarky comments about Heacham Parish Council. There were no neighbourhood plans in 2017, which is why there couldn't be any objections on neighbourhood plans. There are neighbourhood plans now, and that's why the objections are made. Neither was this a late submission by Heacham Parish Council. It was submitted last summer. Officers forgot to put it on your agenda item, which is why it appeared as a late item um, in the correspondence. It should have been there, and the Haitian Parish Council should have been there on your agenda item as a consultee, because they were consulted. So that's the first point. The next thing is about sewage. Lots of laugh laughs about sewage. All the sewage from Monstanton, all the surrounding area, goes down sewage pipes down the hill into Haitian. All we get from that area is the is the crap from everybody else. Excuse me. And it has to be. I'm sorry. Can so, you moderate all right, your I'll, I'll moderate my language. But I mean, that's not an awful word. That's another strike this time. Oh, oh. that's another strike. Fine. <laughs> it all goes oh, down to Heacham. It gets tankered out the waste from Heacham. If they try and improve the Heacham sewage works, because they've already admitted they can't, they haven't got the capacity. It means more tankering through Heacham. More tankering um, up to the A149, likely through the village because the A149 is going to be clagged up with the development we talked about um, last time. The sewage pipes between um, Heacham and Hunstanton, are they going to dig all those up and replace them because they need a higher capacity, they need bigger pipes? I very much doubt it. I don't <coughs> hang in water do a fat lot at all. It'll just mean more tankering and more overspills into the already thank, polluted sea. Thank you very much, Councillor Parish. Right, Stuart, if you'd like to come back, please. Just on, on the highways, of course, you've got down the road, the Bennett Home site, which is accessed straight onto the uh, the main road. I, I think the, the policy you're talking about is DM12, but that's about the, the, the strategic road network outside settlements. This is in, in inside, part of understanding. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, the policy here is, and this is the same access as, as was proposed in, in, in 2017. So I think they're different things. In terms of angling water, they've obviously got no objection. We can't issue a moratorium on any new development. It's effectively what we're saying there. On that, just 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 can't happen. And and, and the actual providers have got, have got no objection because they'll have to deal with. It. Mm -hmm. Um, Cash arrives next, and I've got knock holds and do uh, a you. new point. Um, I think this is an excellent proposal, but I'd like to be a truly great proposal. Um, 
I was listening with great interest to Ms. Goldbrent's obvious passion proposal. And the idea of mixing sort of privatizing uh, retirement type homes is, is, is just is, is a wonderful idea. But how would we make it absolutely great? I think the first thing that clearly is an issue of the parking. You're going to have a large number of elderly people, their carers and their guests, and there just is not adequate parking. Uh, people are going to turn up in cars. Where are they going to put those cars? They're going to end up in the main residence. So I really think that that, you know, we've glossed over that and we're playing with a, a Norfolk County Council policy when it's clear that there is a, a neighbourhood plan requirement for adequate parking. And this scheme fails to deliver that adequate parking. So that's a problem for me. The second thing I think is that um, we have this ongoing problem sort of with, uh, with the sewage, basically. And I think sometimes as councillors, we should provide some sort of leadership. And here we've, I mean, I have personal experience of Angry Water, as I'm sure many of us do. And I wouldn't call them the most reliable water supervision company in the country. I personally would be minded to kind of uh, <clears throat> either delay or defer this one or even vote against, because I think it really does matter that the sewage issue is unambiguously resolved. And this is because this is in a major kind of um, uh, holiday area of North Norfolk. Uh, and we should not be playing with that by saying, well, Anglo Water, they'll probably do it. They say they've got to do it. They've got an obligation to it. For me, that's not good enough. I would like to see an absolute commitment before I would agree to this policy. I'm um, sorry, should I wait? No, I'm just clarifying what you just said. I'm asking, have they got, if this was to be approved, they've got a statutory duty to provide this because of this extra housing. I want to my, clarify. Thank you. Well, my, view is, in my experience, that's just not good enough. There's clearly an ongoing problem and they need some commitment by Angler Water before we, act, we as a committee okay, actually approve this. That's my fear. Stuart, I just want Stuart to answer okay. that, then I'll take your next bit. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, they, they have a statutory duty to, to do that. I, I absolutely understand that. But we, but it, we have no um, powers over and above the statutory duty they have. They, it's a statutory duty. And I hear you. We have one very commercial part, which is we say no until this is resolved. And then that's an obligation falls onto the developer. The, the but problem with that is you've got to be able to defend that on appeal and be yeah. able to demonstrate yeah. that you've not. Well, my, my own point would be that sewage is, is a major issue and we would be irresponsible to the residents of Hunstanton and Beach if we did not address that aggressively. Anyway, sorry, I digress. Perhaps. Right. You've got an next point, please. Okay. Sorry. I'd also like to talk about the, the, uh, the housing, the quantity the quantum of the housing. Related to the absence of parking is a large number of houses. And although no one's referred to it in this room, clearly it's some sort of viability study it must have been done. As ever, the viability study is not disclosed to any councillors. As an accountant, I obviously would like to see it. But I've had this issue before that I'm merely assured by officers that a viability study has been done. The assertion was made that by the developer that uh, to be viable in most of these houses. Uh, and that, I think, hasn't been challenged. So I think we, as a council, again, make a mistake that we don't sort of prioritise that. The final thing, uh, I've got other points, but I will make this the final one, uh, relates to, relates again to, to, to the housing. I would like to see a restriction on the ability for short-term lets of these houses. I understand the argument people have had about sort of, you know, you know, there's a high probability that many of these uh, free market homes will be uh, second homes. Sorry. Yeah. I, Will be will be second homes, uh, and that is sort of unavoidable. That's the way of the world. But I would like to see a restriction, especially as we have large numbers of elderly people on this side. Restriction preventing short-term lets. And I'm sure many of us have sort of situations where we have Airbnb lets in our vicinity, and by and large, it's incredible the amount of noise these generate. You do get. I'm not going to say drug crazy office. Anyone would think I might have been one once, but obviously I wasn't. Uh, but you have large numbers of people coming up for short-term holidays. They have no respect whatsoever for, the, for, the, for their neighbours, and they make a lot of noise. And to actually allow that to happen on a site, which is primarily a, a, a home care site, I just I cannot accept that. I just think that's absolutely wrong, and I would like to see that condition, that there are no short-term lets on this site. Right, Stuart's going to come back on this one, because... Right. You'll probably know that's, that there's currently a government consultation out on the issue of short-term lets, Airbnb. It's a national issue. It's not something we can take action against at the moment. They're talking about potentially a new use class, short-term lets for, for new build. But that's some way off yet. It's only at the very early stage and so consultation um, 
uh, at the moment. So we have no way of, of no one dealing with that anyway. It's going to be incredibly difficult to, to do. But at the moment, that, that's just a consultation. So we're not in a position. We've got no policy to back that up at, at, at present. Might change in the future, but now is certainly not the time to do that. We could never defend that position. Right. Did you wish to come back? Uh, yes. I, I did, in fact, read in the papers over the weekend that uh, a number of county councils have made these conditions. So regardless of what the national requirement is, a number of county councils are doing this. And I believe, you know, we in West Norfolk and North Norfolk are primarily a holiday area and we should really respect all the people who live here and we should be leading, not just kind of following the path. That would be likely to be the neighbourhood plan. I mean, yeah. there are certain areas where, where they do have that, 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 that restriction. Hunstanton's not, not one of them. That was... I think they tried to do that with the examiner. It didn't get through the examination. They may come back in the, you know, I mean, with the future, respect. but it would be in those specific, very targeted um, areas. With respect, so there's just... also the reason to not do anything. I mean, I've tried to set up why I, I think this is a wonderful scheme, and I would like to make it a truly great scheme. Okay. Can I just... Oh. Can we just get the officers to answer, and then yeah. I'm... The we don't make policy. There are avenues that we take these conversations to get it ratified, but we don't do it on the hoof in here. Stuart, could yeah. I just ask you a question a minute? Oi. Here we are. What? Um, yeah, I mean, on, on that on that basis, I mean, it's not. It's, this is not the, um, the time to do it with this one with this one application. Uh, we'd have to, like, as I said before, you'd have to be able to, to defend that position mm -hmm. and appeal. And we just couldn't do that. Just yeah. Couldn't, uh, capable of doing it. I just got to see a bit of clarification of Stuart for a minute. Stuart. Mm. Yeah. I've just asked Stuart the question because you made a con proposed condition to be added regarding prioritization of locals. Having heard Stuart's advice, do you wish to retract it or carry on? No, just carry on. Right. So in other words, then, I need to know, have you got a seconder, please? Right. Wendy, I'm going to take that as a vote first, so we go along and do things. Would you just elaborate again, please, what exactly the condition you want us to vote on? The condition would be... The condition would be that priority is first given to local residents, that means residents of Unstanton and the surrounding area, for um, access to the um, housing with care facilities. Um, I could add also to the market-led housing, but maybe that's a step too far, but certainly to the housing with care facilities. And how long have they have to live in the vicinity? Well, going on the previous um, agreed uh, planning application several years ago, I think it was three years. Right. Is that acceptable as a condition, please? It doesn't meet, the test, as I've said. I mean, you, you can put it forward and vote, and there's no backing for it in terms of policy. My view is that the, it's best to approach this through, through our own housing policy. You know, separately, uh, look at it that way, not not just add things that can't be backed up oh. at uh, planning committee with, with individual applications that we, we seem to be singling out one application for that. Uh, and that's my concern. Right. Martin, you've got a yeah, yeah, Madam Chairman, yeah. And first of all, I agree with some, obviously, what counts as regards this uh, vote we're never going to take. As regards, first of all, I am committed, and I'm sure we are, local homes for local people. I've always said that for 30 odd years, still apparent and true today. But the reason, Councillor Parish, with your um, motion you put forward there is to say, well, the surrounding area. How far does this surrounding area cover? That's the question, because we could encompass all of West Norfolk as a surrounding area. So we just want to be sure of what area we're voting on. Um, just a minute, I'm, I've got another one coming in, Councillor Long. Yeah, just to speak on the amendment that's been Yeah, proposed. I'm on the amendment at the yeah, moment. Yeah. Um, care places have to be allocated on the basis of care need, not geography. There could be somebody right across the right across West Norfolk or, you know, just over the border into Breckland who absolutely needs that type of facility. 
We've got elderly people who are dying alone at home, lonely. And actually these facilities provide places where they can interact with others, where the care can be delivered to a location instead of care workers driving all, all around, you know, multiple locations. Um, and they provide the facilities where interaction can happen. The hairdressers, little tiny shop, that sort of thing. Um, and and we're, we're arguing whether or not that we, you know, we can have a local criteria acceptance. Well, we, it really needs to be based on need. And I think Councillor Parrish should have some compassion and withdraw what is a ridiculous, ridiculous uh, request that housing with care is allocated on the basis of where you happen to come from. Absolutely ludicrous. Just a minute, Stuart. Just, just to come back, I mean, Carl will come back further, but this, this site was allocated for a borough-wide need because this is the site we've got that's come forward. It's been long in the in the making. We've been looking oh. uh, looking for a, for a site, and that's why it was allocated in the plan, and I'm supposed to be allocated in the next plan, so it can provide for that borough-wide need. Right. We're only talking on this allocation of need and this condition, nothing else. So don't go and walk into other areas. Councillor Roberts. Thanks. On the amendment, uh, I, I think Councillor Long is not necessarily talking correctly with his views. I can't see that there's any problem at all if you have a situation, let's imagine that there's one, uh, one unit becomes available here, and there are two people who need it. Uh, one is in Methwold, and one of them is in Hunstanty. In that particular situation, I would have thought it would be natural that uh, we should have a policy which would favour the local person. The local person should be allowed to kind of retire into their local area where their friends are, where their family is, where they have local knowledge. So I don't see there's any conflict there whatsoever. I just think it's a rational and sensible Sorry, I'm talking. Yeah, right. uh, I just think it's a rational and sensible idea that we support, with, you know, this wonderful facility is there for the support of the local community where it can be done. Yeah. I'm not suggesting for a second anyone can die denied access to this. But I'm just saying in those particular situations, then I would have a natural preference for people within the Hunstanton Beach and area. I'm going to cut this conversation now. We've had enough debate on it. I've got Carl coming back, then I want to take the vote. We need to move on. So the site was allocated to me to borough wide need, and um, this is the only housing with care scheme currently um, forecast to come forward. But there, there may be others at other play, uh, in other parts of the um, borough at later dates. But yeah, for now, this is the only site that would have permission, um, and therefore, you know, it would meet that borough wide need rather than a specific need um, for Hunstanton. Thank you. Right, Wendy, if you take the vote now, please, and Stuart, read it sorry, out. Sorry, please. So final clarification. Uh, obviously, you're voting for a local restriction criteria. That would have to be in the Section 106 agreement. Just to clarify, yes. that's not a condition. It would have to be in the Section 106. Okay. Right, Wendy. So you're voting for the condition proposed by Councillor Parrish at this moment. So just to clarify, it's not a condition. Well, um, it's a restriction in the 106. It would have to be. All right, restriction yeah. in the 106. Okay, members, everybody clear what they're voting on? Any right? Sorry, can Chair, you? may I just clarify? I, my understanding is it's a prioritization rather than a restriction, per se. Yeah, yeah. prioritization. Prior. Is, that, is yeah. that correct? Is that correct? parish? Yeah, right. Over to you, Wendy, please, if you'll take the vote. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bauer against Councillor Bubb against Councillor Holmes. Four. Councillor Howland. Against. Councillor Hudson. Hudson. Councillor Lawton. Four. Councillor Manning. Against. Councillor Knuckles. Against. Councillor Parrish. Four. Councillor Mrs. Viking. Against. Councillor Storey. Against. Councillor Tyler. Against. Councillor Diwali. Four. Councillor Whitby. Against. Councillor Long. Against. Councillor Rose. Against. And Councillor Rives. Four. That's one, two, three, four, five, four. Eleven against and one abstention. So Thank what was it that? So that, that is lost, Councillor Parrish. So now we move on. So Chair. Um, Sorry, I've got some other speakers. 
but, but I wanted to propose an amendment, that's all, but when, when you're ready. Let me have the further debate. That doesn't lose you, preclude you from coming back, but let the others have their say, because you've had quite a lot. Councillor Knuckles hasn't spoken yet, so it's over to you. Thank you. Um, I'm totally in support of this application. I have nursed in, in the area of Hunstanton where people have moved from other areas. I've nursed in the whole of West Norfolk and in people's homes. And when they're in their own little home, just with a partner or on their own, they feel so insecure. They, they cannot get care for 24 hours. Uh, and the families are very, very concerned. So um, an area with housing, with care, with where the families could even purchase one of the other homes with lots of open space for partners who are quite well. I think this is an excellent scheme which West Norfolk really does need. We've got so many elderly families in, in West Norfolk. And to have something like this, I think, will make so many families feel a lot more secure if they're elderly parents living in, in, in this type of scheme. I haven't said anything yet, but I am in favour of this scheme. It is so needed. When you go and visit the elderly, the desperation of loneliness that these people have is unbelievable. I visit a lady who's on her own, dependent on a few carers going in half an hour in the morning, get her up, lunchtime, tea time at night, desperate for a face, a talk, somebody around you. The silence is terrible. And I think this coming forward in this day and age is brilliant. It is so needed. And we are an elderly population out in West Norfolk and it's crying out the need and I know I have an elderly mother and I'm very fortunate with her, those that know my mum her age and what she does but for those that don't we're here for them and I'm sorry I understand the concerns and we do have things that still can be put right with Anglia Water I don't negate that at all that has to come forward but this could help it it could be the nudge over the hill that will get some help. So for me, the two can crossing, there is a bus at the top, they can have access to the shops, and maybe there'll be other services going in that we don't know about. There's an opportunity, there's jobs here, that's needed winter and summer. So for me, this is a welcome addition. It has already got approval from previously, but this is an enhancement. So for me, let's see it happen. Now I've got another conversation with Councillor Diwali then Rise, and they want to be new points, please. And then I'm going to take Councillor's story because I love having him last. He'll come out with some pearls of wisdom, as I always know. <laughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, it was just a uh, clarification, which I was unable to uh, do earlier on the, um, with regards to page 29, uh, penultimate paragraph, it says, as further mitigation is proposed that a specific, a specific area of open grassland type habitat is created off-site, according to the countryside stewardship option AB8, to comprise a flower-rich grass margin with an annual cut. This would be at least 650 metres squared in area um, and provide habitat areas for a range of farmland species, including a foraging area, etc. Um, I was Sorry, my understanding was that that was not going to happen um, so I just wanted clarification on why, because uh, this comes under ecology. Um, secondly, I think it's important that we have clarification on um, site F2.5 um, and on page 21, on the third paragraph, it says the care apartments will be located on the site designated under F2.5, which is the employment allocation. However, it is considered that the care apartments do not constitute an employment use. Now, um, that's the technical side of it, but it's still deemed it's in, in accordance with the aims of the site allocation. Um, I just wanted clarification on how that is um, effectively overridden. Um, and finally, I, I, I didn't hear or understand or get uh, a full response on the question with regards to um, cycle paths shared with pedestrians um, who could be very vulnerable. Thank you. Right, Cash. Yeah, sorry. So apologies. Yes, there is um, an area of land as per the um, proposed condition. It's a Skylark mitigation area. Um, 
and that is just um, along this boundary. Um, I have a I have a paper plan. I could go into uniform and show the plan if you want to see it. But there is a plan that is listed in the conditions. Yes, there is. I apologise. And cycles. That yeah, the, the, the cycle though. If any cycle, there's no cycle route throughout the site, um, and any off-site cycle routes are as they as they are, and they are generally shared. Um, in relation to the point of F2.5 and that being an em employment use, um, the apartment building is located within, within that site. Um, additionally, the outline, the previous outline application considered that the, the two allocations could be merged. And <laughs> I believe there is a specific reference in in this document as well that suggests oh. that they can likewise be um, considered to together. So the, the outline plan considered the the two together um, is an acceptable way forward. Okay. Thank you. Right, council arrives. A new point, please. Thank you. And I've got council store. Thank you. It's always a delight to uh, agree. Uh, Ninety-nine percent with uh, Councillor Spikings, and I respected your very passionate uh, approval of the scheme. And I myself, I think it's, I think it's a great idea, and it's what we need. But I go back to what I said that I would rather it was a great idea than just a good idea. And therefore, I'd like to propose that we defer this motion uh, because there are a number of issues I think which do need clarification. And to list these in no particular order. There's Councillor Bob's excellent point about how the heating could be made much more efficient. Uh, there's my possibly not so excellent point about the parking uh, problems there. Um, and uh, to my mind, the, the issue of uh, the reluctance of our officers to support some sort of government restricting short term uh, rental of these properties is absolutely critical in what is a care home complex. Um, you've already said that. I have, but now I'm making a, a I'm, 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 I want to. If someone will second me, I want to defer to considerations because, to my mind, these are important issues, which, if corrected, would make this a truly great, excellent, superb project, as opposed to just a very good one. Do you have a second for that? No. Then we carry on. You will? Right. Yeah, defer it. Councillor Norton. Right. Bye. Uh... I shall not be voting for a deferral. I think I've got more than enough here in front of me mm -hmm. to make a considered decision. So yeah, I'm think. going to put it to the vote. Wendy, please. And we will see how this takes. Okay, so Councillor Bauer. Against. Councillor Bubb. Against. Councillor Holmes. For. Councillor Howland. Against. Councillor Hudson. Against. Councillor Lawton. Mm. Councillor Manning. Against. Councillor Nichols. Against. Councillor Parrish. For. Councillor Mrs. Spiking. Against. Councillor Storey. Against. Councillor Tyler. Against. Councillor Diwali. For. Councillor Whitby. Against. Councillor Long. Against. Councillor Rose. Against. And Councillor Rides. Uh, four. Thank you, Chair. Right. We'll just get the result, then I'll take you, Councillor Story. So that's one, two, three, five, four, and 12 against. That's uh, refused. Councillor Story, now you're next. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say this is probably one of the most complete applications which has come forward to this borough planning committee this application in my opinion features everything you would want to see i'm sure in your area and i would like to see a plan and application come like this in my area i would love one to come like this as catering for people obviously some part of the application who can't cater very well for themselves so obviously that's the first and foremost. The first and foremost point, as you all know, the most important thing we all have is our health. If we haven't got that, we're all snookered. And this application is caring for those people. Some part of this application is caring for people who aren't in a fortunate position to do so for themselves. 
We see an application come forward, Madam Chairman, of 50% affordable. Could, could, wouldn't, wouldn't we, be, wouldn't, wouldn't be, we wouldn't be in a mess with our housing stock if we had many applications like this. We do need all this affordable housing and more besides. Having read through this report at length, Madam Chairman, and probably twice, the lady who spoke um, earlier on, I think Paula Broadbent, was it? Yeah, Paula Broadbent. She did indicate this was a local development for local people. And I think, obviously, that's probably exactly what it is to a certain degree. Chairman, I can't understand why people, why this application personally has probably gone on so long. Because this is a gift that West Norfolk, in my opinion, has been waiting for for some time. And that is, Chairman, and we've got an application here. We've got 19 consultees all in favour. We've got two probably a little bit undecided, and we have one against. So to me, that's nearly a straightforward proposition. And I would be, I'm proud to be in West Norfolk to have an application like this come forward. We should grasp this application here and now. We should move forward with it. That's the right application in the right place at the right time. And I hope this company comes forward with more applications on this basis and I hope they're my part of the world, as well as other part of West Norfolk. And I congratulate the application for a complete uh, applicant for a complete application. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well done. Thank you. Right. Anybody else wanting to add who hasn't spoke before? Because if not, I'm going to take you to the conditions now in the late correspondence, please. Can you all read this? Because this is what we're next going to vote on. It's amend condition three. Remove six and seven and eight, given that the historic environmental service has confirmed they're no longer required as condition. Amend a condition 11, or will now read eight. Amend condition four, 24, which will be re renumbered 21. And add two conditions that were originally omitted 27 and 28. Are we happy to have those alterations and additions, please, members? Agreed. Right. Then on which case, I'm going to take you to the recommendation to is approve, included those conditions we've just voted on. And it reads, subject to conditions and the satisfactory completion of a Section 106 agreement to secure affordable housing, open space provision and maintenance, such provision and maintenance, and GIRAM's mitigation payment within four months of the date of this committee resolution, and B, in the event that the Section 106 agreement is not completed within four months of the date of this committee meeting, the application will be refused due to the failure to secure affordable housing, open space provision, and maintenance of SUDS provision, and maintenance and Durham's mitigation payment. The recommendation is approved. Wendy, can you take the vote, please? Yes, thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bauer. Four. Councillor Buff. Four. Councillor Holmes. Against. Councillor Howland? Four. Councillor Hudson? Four. Councillor Lawton? Absolutely. Councillor Manning? Four. Councillor Knuckles? Four. Councillor Parrish? Four. Councillor Mrs. Spiking? Four. Councillor Story? Very much four. Councillor <laughs> Tyler? Four. Councillor Diwali? Four. Councillor Whitby. Four. Councillor Long. Four. Councillor Rose. Four. Councillor Rides. Four. That's carried, Chairman. Thank you. Therefore, that approval has been carried. Now, members, I'm going to have a comfort break because you sat very long time, and I'm sure <laughs> you like a cup of drink. I would like you back, please, by roughly five past. And remember, members, we are still in recess. Thank you. What about that chair? All right, how about that for the meeting? A good old hand. Oh, do it. What do we do?
I'm just waiting for Councillor Bob and Tyler. Are they coming? Go and hug them up. Mm. A change in the order of the experience. Well, this one you've got somebody's no, job in a different. Oh, no, not this one. No, no, this one. No, no, well, okay. Oh, right. A bit further right. along. Oh. Right. Councillor Bird, two. So that's... Hello, Georgia. We're ready to reconvene now. Thank you. Right. Are we back on YouTube? Right. Everybody comfy? Right. I'm going to start again, please, members. We're on page 44, Kings Lynn, and there's late correspondence and two speakers. And it's for the demolition of the Inspire Centre, including its associated car park, etc. And it's at the location is a QE Hospital is a full application and the recommendation here is to approve. So is that you, Hannah? Tash, you're doing that one? Yep. Okay. Yes, so um, this is an application at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital site. Um, again, the plan in your agenda is, is probably clearer in relation to showing where this site is in relation to the, the overall QE hospital site. Um, so it seeks full planning permission for a 1,383 space multi-storey car park. Um, it will be over six levels and parking would be provided over two phases and would provide a total of 98 disabled parking spaces and 1,285 ambulant bays. It would have automatic number plate recognition to manage parking and payments with the options to either pay on foot or upon exit. The building, which is um, a substantial building, so the building measures 21.7 metres to the top of the, the vertical bins and 25.3 metres to the top of the roof stair cores. Uh, the top deck of the parking area is 18 metres above the lower deck of the parking area. Vehicular access and egress is from the the north, so from within the hospital site. Uh, there are associated um, vehicular works throughout the, the site itself. Um, bear with me a moment, try and find the appropriate plans. So they are, they include um, widening of the, the road, pedestrian crossings, um, including tactile paving areas. As part of this application, the, the existing bus stop needs to be relocated. The existing bus stop lies just to the north of, of the site, and that is going to be relocated up here, um, just outside of the entrance to the, to the main car park. So the site is not in any um, protected areas. Um, it is not in an area at risk of flooding. However, there are a number of um, listed buildings in the locality. These are the moated site in Crows Wood, the remains of St. James Church, uh, the ruins of St. James Church and Church Farmhouse. The key issues are as outlined um, on page 45 of this application. So uh, just like to, to um, provide a point of clarification. So this application does indeed include the demolition of the Inspire Centre in its description. However, a previous application has all already um, pro provided um, demolition. So that does not need to be, be considered as part of this application. However, what is does need to be um, considered, but has also been considered under a previous application, is that this site currently um, accommodates, so th this is the site, 
it accommodates um, existing car parking. Mm. Now, to ensure that whilst the multi-storey car park is being built, that all car parking is, um, is provided, so there's no loss of parking during construction, there was a previous application that has granted temporary consent for three car park areas. Um, and this application for the multi-storey car park, there is a condition that requires that those temporary car parks are in operation before the multi-storey car park is, is approved, um, is um, construction starts. So just to, to show you, this is the site of the proposed development, and this shows the three temporary car parks. So there's one to the north, there's one here next to the ambulance um, bays, and some here at the end of the existing car park and some down near, near the helipad. So as previously stated, this application is over two phases. Now, phase one, um, which is on the car park area, this is due to take place um, regardless of any funding that is received for a future hospital building. However, if a future hospital, if there is funding pro um, provided, then phase two would take place, which would then free up the existing main car park as the location for the new QE hospital. Hmm. So this is um, the, the multi-storey building. It is, a, it is a large structure. It is what it is. Um, and we'll just go and look through some, some photographs now. So this is taken from Winston Churchill Drive, looking towards the recently approved endoscopy building. So the multi-storey would be in this location. Uh, just from another angle from Winston Churchill Drive, you can see the hoarding around the existing Inspire building. This is the car park where phase one would take place. This is where phase two would take place. Again, another view showing the endoscopy. You can see the wind turbine. This is the, the car park. <coughs> we have another view from Gayton Road. This is a view from the helicopter landing area, looking north. We've got the endoscopy building, the car park, and the Inspire building. Um, this is taken from the Bund to the, the southwest of the A149. So it's not really a view anyone's ever going to see because generally people don't walk along the Bund on the A149, but it, it's, a, it's a good high level picture showing the site. Um, it's from the main car park. This shows across the site towards the junction of Winston Churchill Drive. So the, the opposite view from the, the previous ones taken. This is from within the hospital site itself, looking at the hoarding around the existing Inspire building. This is a view, obviously, from the, the mini roundabout, showing the site. Another view heading from the mini roundabout towards the, the main hospital roundabout. And then these are views of the housing on the opposite side of the road, showing the, the screening that's already in place, the small roundabout at Winston Churchill Drive, and likewise, the, uh, the housing on the other side of Winston Churchill Drive. Could that phone be turned off, please? We've asked you to turn off. Thank you. These were provided by the, the applicant. Um, they were provided in relation to um, concerns regarding huh? generally the impact on the Sorry, historic environment. Somebody's got their phone I have off. a horrible feeling. Well, turn it off, please. It's ridiculous having it on. Yellow card. Yellow card. <laughs> right, sorry Tash, carry on. So this shows a photo montage of it, and this is from the slip road that runs alongside or adjacent to Gayton Road, which is on the other side of, of the hedge. This shows it from the, the hospital roundabout. So this is the this comes from the Hardwick. Um, this is the, the direction from Gate, and so this kind of view taken from between those two. This is from the, the mini roundabout. And these are from the, the scheduled mon monuments uh, to the east of the site. And so the application is before you with a recommendation of approval. It was referred by the assistant director as, as obviously it, it is a, it's a very important application. 
Um, that's it, thank you. Thank you. Uh, could I have Alice Webster first, please? You have five minutes. Good morning. We'll start again. No, put it on. Yeah, over we go. <laughs> I do apologise. Good morning and thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital Kings Lynn. Let me introduce myself. I'm Alice Webster, the recently appointed Chief Exec for the QEH and formerly the Chief Nurse. As you will be very aware, the QEH has an ambition of being the best rural district general hospital for both patient and staff experience. Our mission is to work with patients, staff, partners and our local community to improve the health and clinical outcomes of our local communities. And we have begun the journey of improvement. However, we need to do this together in buildings that are modern and fit for purpose. You will all be very familiar with our current issues of the reinforced autoclave aerated concrete, known as RAC, and the challenges this poses. QEH was built in the 1980s and over 79% of our hospital buildings have RAC planks. Most of the estate is therefore affected. We have an end of life date for the um, estate of 2030 based on national expert view. The life of RAC is 30 years and QEH is now 42. Our unique RAC challenges therefore require us to think differently about how we not only deliver services for our communities now, but also into the future, and how we might do this whilst we're developing our buildings. We continue to develop the site, as you will have seen, with the new endoscopy unit, for which we have see, received national recognition, but more importantly, our patients have enjoyed first-class facilities in which to receive their care. We remain committed to developing services fit for the future. The easiest way of describing this is as a jigsaw. All the pieces need to fit together, but may be placed in the picture at different times. However, what is not in question is the continuation of services for our population and staff whilst we do this. The current application before you this morning is for a multi-storied car park, and it's the first step of our estate plan and is critical part of us being investment ready. We know how much the community has supported the trust to go ahead with the new hospital. Crumbling out of data state is a significant issue for our patients, those who use our services and our staff, and we continue to develop a case for our community to receive the news it rightly deserves, a new hospital. Thank you for your continued support as we tirelessly strive to achieve national funding and make this happen. We have continued to plan for the delivery of a new hospital given there is no alternative and we remain committed to ensure that the trust is ready to maximise opportunity for funding. We remain hopeful this decision will be soon. People attending our hospital continue to grow and will grow further as new housing developments increase the local population. The new multi-storey car park is required as one of our key developments to support the delivery of the new hospital and so to avoid disruption and delay um, and any planning application may pose. We know that the impact of not happen, having this multi-storey car park will become an issue on an already on-site parking problem. It provides significant personal challenges for individuals getting to appointments, surgery and visiting loved ones. We do not believe this is tolerable for anyone who may be worried, anxious or have a health-related condition that makes walking distances difficult. In summary, our trust has an ambition to transform and enhance the staff, visitor and patient experience in relation to parking. The requisite of this facility is to ensure a safer, sustainable and future-proofed experience for all, whilst also freeing up space for another part of our hospital site to be developed for clinical services to serve our local population. I therefore invite the committee to support our application and to grant our <laughs> Queen Elizabeth Hospital Trust the planning permission today in order that we can continue to develop our hospital for our patients, our staff and our community of West Norfolk. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Now I'd like Simon Holdcroft, please. Morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. Uh, I'm Simon Holcroft. I'm from Exit Group. I'm the planning agent for Queen Elizabeth Hospital NHS Trust, and I'm speaking in support of the application. Um, permission is sought for the development of a multi story car park with associated highway works, engineering works, drainage works, and landscaping following the demolition of the Inspire Centre. 
The application helps to meet an identified requirement of car parking capacity to address the current high demand for staff, patients and visitors parking for the hospital. The proposal is also part of the long-term state strategy required for a new hospital. The proposed development would be providing a total of 1,383 car parking spaces in phases one and therefore then two. From a national local planning policy level, there is a presumption in favour of enhanced community facilities, including supporting projects such as this to deliver the further development of the QEH to meet current and future needs. The multi-storey car park also forms a key enabler to release inadequate surface car parking to facilitate the delivery of a new hospital funding permitted. It has been demonstrated that there are no technical or infrastructure constraints to the site's development which would prevent its delivery and that there are no direct conflicts with either specific policies within the national planning policy framework or the council's adopted development plan. As such, it can be demonstrated that there are no adverse impacts arising from the development that are sufficient either individually or collectively to out outweigh the benefits, particularly taken into account the weight that must be given to the presumption in favour of sustainable development. And when assessed against the up-to-date excuse me, policy objectives in national planning policy. Um, following a thorough site appraisal that was identified, the Inspire Centre location provided a suitable site where this car park capacity can be accommodated. Phase one is for demand now, and phase two is for the future hospital. Given the site constraints on land ownership and need to relate to the existing hospital, this is the only site available and suitable and deliverable for the proposed development. Recently approved schemes take up other development sites, which we've spoken about earlier with the endoscopy building, the new nursery and vaccination centre, and also a consented diagnostic assessment centre. The siting of the multi-storey car park is the only option to facilitate the wider new hospital master plan and the decant of the old hospital. The recently consented temporary car park accommodates the lost car parking from the application site during construction, therefore ensuring throughout construction there will be no net loss of car parking given how sensitive car parking issues are at the hospital. The proposed design is functional whilst being appropriate for its location. The development is of a scale which respects the site constraints and overall limited land availability across the hospital. The proposal makes efficient and effective use of the sites to enable the existing surface car parking which is earmarked for the new hospital, allowing the new hospital to be fully constructed whilst the existing hospital remains in, in operation. This is an essential requirement in order to maintain the current acute healthcare facilities in West Norfolk. The application sets out how the design has evolved through a process of assessment and evaluation, taking into account the brief to meet the requirements for the use of the building and the site context. There have also been design features such as the elevational detailing of the vertical cladding fins, which ensures that the building elements are broken up to reduce any perceptions of overbearing design as well as being constructed of materials which give a transparent view through the building to enable it to sit comfortably within the surrounding environment. The main external cladding has been designed as a vertical powder coated fins with a curved slash wave profile, sorry, which spans levels one to six. The main color of the fins are silver with a mix of additional colors running through the elevation. The theme for these colors ties in with the trust corporate brand and color scheme of yellow, green and blue. Phase one is needed now and cannot wait to meet existing demand. And phase two is required to fit in with the wider hospital programme. With regards to consultee responses, there are no listed objections on the scheme as it stands at committee today. Applicant and agent have worked with the council to ensure that the application was front loaded with a high level of supporting technical information. Any objections that have been made relate to heritage impact of the scheme on nearby surrounding statutory designations. Additional supporting information commissioned by the Trust during the application has carefully reviewed the comments raised by Historic England and concluded that there is less than substantial harm in the development on nearby designations. Also in respect, respect to transport and parking, extensive pre-application engagement was undertaken with both planning officers and highway authority officers to ensure this application is supported at all levels. The proposal promotes and integrates well with the use of existing staff in visitor cycle parking facilities. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything to add, please? No. Well, I, there's a couple of questions I'd like to ask. I'll open the meeting and we'll take the debate. Um, car park sizes, 
How do these compare in this multi-storey to what we have on the ground, please, size-wise? Because uh, the, the car park spaces are the, the minimum standard of parking, which is two by five metres for the for the kind of normal bays and the the disabled bays are three by five metres with, I believe it's 1.2 metres all the way around. So what are they on the ground at the moment, the size? Because it's all very well. There are bigger cars and things like that. And the worst thing you can have when going in a multi-storey is squeezing in like Peterborough with a pillar in the way and you're edging in like this. Exactly. And so I'm sorry, I just hope that these sizing that's being proposed, you say minimum, but that is to me not very big. Let's have a look compared to what we've got. That is adequate. You go in there, you know, you can get out with your doors and all the rest of it. But that is a standard 2.5. That one is as well. Yeah. yeah. Right. And the other thing is as well, the cash machine, uh, the machine I see that you're going to have in and out. Can you have it please as well that people can pay with cash? Because not everybody has phones and apps and they don't always work around here. So yes. I'm sorry. Let's be real. Can we have both, please? Because there's a lot of elderly people that will use this that don't have it. And we're here to serve all the community, not just to select for sondage. So, and as for the design, I rather like it. Let's move on. Have something iconic. It stands out. It is what it is. This, to me, looks absolutely lovely. Right. And now I've got Council de Wally, then Parish and Hudson. Thank you, Chair. Um, it certainly does stand out. Unfortunately, I'm concerned uh, with the, um, the heritage impact. Um, uh, the Church of St. James and uh, surrounding medieval settlement has been noted, but there are also uh, Bronze Age barrows in the vicinity. Um, before um, it was a Norman church, it was a Saxon church, and it's generally well known that prime pagan sites were occupied by churches. So the surrounding uh, landscape is extraordinarily important historically and uh, will perhaps in future be um, recognized as such. However, um, the I know that the, the Knights Hill development, there was concern that it didn't impinge on the skyline for, um, uh, for the surrounding area. Um, because of these heritage assets. Um, and I'm, I have difficulty because I know how much this is needed, but equally, uh, I feel that better work could have been done to, uh, to make this less intrusive on the skyline. Um, I, I won't uh, stand in the way of this, but I would certainly like some um, explanation as to to what extent um, the heritage impact has been um, has actually been considered because what I see in the um, uh, in the reports is um, historic England awaiting comments. I didn't see anything in late correspondence, which I may have missed. Um, however, so I would just like some uh, clarification on that, please. Uh, my other issue is the access onto the 149. The hospital is going to have to get bigger um, because West North has got bigger since the 1980s. Um, and the amendments are not ideal. I um, had uh, someone, um, as I was trying to go out of the, um, what do you call it, the, 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 the filter lane, which is really not long enough. Um, people have a tendency to go onto the roundabout and you have to have um, your wits about you because they then go down the 149 without using the filter lane because they are um, have problems with it. Uh, we do need to improve the access onto the 149, and uh, that, that was my other concern. Thank you. On the heritage, we've got quite a, you've got quite a detailed um, assessment of that, really, page 56 going all the way through to, to 59, and, and certainly page 58 and 59 dis discusses the heritage um, impact. As you know, the National Planning Policy Framework, the parcels, if you like, harm into less substantial and substantial and you've got to uh, assess that in this case it's less of a substantial harm but so you've then got to assess the, the public the benefits against that harm which is what we've done on page 63 effectively in the planning balance that is the issue really and is is 
is assessing that. And, and we, what we've said as officers is that, yes, there is less of substantial harm, but that is outweighed significantly by the public benefits of providing this facility, which is essential an essential part of the potentially new hospital and, or and the existing hospital. So we feel we've done quite a detailed job, if you like, on, mm. on heritage and the, and the impacts um, of it. And we've acknowledged there, are, there is some harm. But again, when you're applying the planning balance, we feel it's significantly outweighed by the, the benefits of, of this scheme in support of, the, of this important facility. Right, Councillor Parrish next. Then I've got Hudson, Long and Bub. Thank you, Chair. Um, first of all, I'd like to agree with Councillor Spikings about the uh, nitty gritty of um, paying for parking. And I, I presume that the, the system in place will enable people to pay for the time they've been there rather than having to guess um, how long they might be there. Um, but that's that's a, a, a detail, but it's an important detail. But um, I very much doubt that this committee is going to stand in the way of uh, this proposal because it's the first step towards having a new hospital. And um, I hope that we vote for this application today and I ask the government to announce the funding tomorrow because there'll be nothing in their way. No, today. <laughs> oh, today then. Today. today. Yeah. Even today, by four o'clock today. Yeah. But yes, you, you can't. There are minor issues, I suppose, that you can debate for hours and hours. But the fundamental thing is that it's uh, it's needed, it's necessary, and it's if it's not provided, you're not going to get any further with a with a new hospital, really. So um, I should be supporting it, and I think everybody else will be as well. Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Hudson. I live just down the road from this. And it is a monstrosity, yeah. but it's needed. We can't do anything about it. It's horrible. Six stories high at the side of the road. This is just at the other side of the grass verge. You're going to be coming up, driving against it. Okay. We, they reckon that's the only place they can put it. There's a lot more land around it, but they could have put it somewhere else. But they've decided it's going to be there. It's going to be a nasty thing to live with, but it's one of those things we're going to have to put up with because we need cars in this area. But it's horrible. And whoever thought about it, well, yeah, I mean, it's just a box, isn't it? Just a box and with some colours on the side. You don't have to live with it. I live down the road, so I have to live with it. So this is life, isn't it? And by the way, I uphold uh, Councillor de Wally's point about the slip road onto the main road, the bypass. It, this is going to take a lot of light down there, and that needs to be investigated because the, the build, this building is going to have um, an impact on the dual carriageway. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Long? And I've got bourbon rocks. Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, obviously, there's going to be folks against this because it involves cars, and then they'll try and find a reason that they don't like cars and then come up with a different reason why we shouldn't have a car park. We absolutely need a car park. We need a car park fit for purpose for the new hospital when it finally gets to go ahead. Um, and the only way you can do that is to phase the build and uh, obviously accommodate the current hospital uh, cars that are going to the hospital already uh, in terms of capacity. And a multi-storey really is the most sensible land use for that, you know, for that facility. Um, obviously, we've seen some pictures. Uh, I think it, I agree with you. I think it looks, it looks uh, quite nice as far as multi-storey car parks go. There are so many technical things that make them usable and user friendly. I know when the um, St. James Monty Story car park was built by the Borough Council in the centre of Kings Lynn, it, you know, the, the, the first year or two that it was built, it won design awards uh, from sort of the AA and various other people looked and assessed and said, you know, that it was good. But that's got flaws. You know, the turning circle into it is, is, is too tight. That kind of thing needs to be looked at and make sure that, the, you know, the sweeps for, uh, are right for the, for the sort of size of modern vehicles that we have now. Um, now, we've got to remember, this doesn't just serve West Norfolk. We always hear our esteemed leader talking about our 550 square mile borough, but this serves Fenland, North Norfolk, 
mm. Breckland and areas beyond <clears throat> it on, on occasion. And on that basis, obviously, people won't be coming there by um, um, any, any pretty much any other means, but mm. apart from uh, vehicular transport, if they're not being taken in the car, then unfortunately, as I've had in recent times, you end up there in an ambulance, which is also a motor vehicle. Um, my concern, if there is any, is the fact that there's 98 disabled spaces. And I have to say, state, I am Norfolk's disability champion. And I'm sure that 98, at uh, seven point something percent of the total spaces is probably in line with national thinking for ordinary car parks. If we were going to build car parking in the centre of Kingsden, we'd probably allocate 7.8% of them as, as, as disabled. But this is a hospital. And by definition, those with disabilities uh, can find themselves having to attend more regularly and therefore more capacity is needed. I know as a disabled person using a disabled badge uh, and knowing the time that it takes to get from the current car parks to where the treatment is going to happen, um, that... Um, you know, driving round and round the car park, hoping that somebody else who's disabled goes because you physically won't be able to get out and walk from some of the other spaces is not is not uh, good. And I've actually raised this with the previous chief of the hospital uh, and and um, mentioned actually about the um, the uh, what was the old for my unit, which was, which is now being used to um, as a, for a different purpose, disabled spaces that were right near that they actually increased the number of them. So I'm hoping that that 98 uh, ought to be uh, some way in, improved if, if it can be, but also uh, make sure that it's on the ground floor of the new, uh, um, the new car park, uh, at least so that disabled people don't have to try and access yeah. steps, lifts and so on. Thank you. Thank you. But otherwise fully supportive. Councillor Bob? Thank you. Yes, this is a scheme that's greatly needed. It, to my mind, looks perfectly good. Uh, it's not uh, surrounded by ancient buildings to clash with. OK, there's a ruined church a long way away. But you've raised the one about the size of the spaces, which I was going to do, so I don't need to do that. This pay on exit is going to be the car park of choice for everybody visiting there, unless the rest of the car parks fall into line. So you're going to get people swarming in there, not finding spaces because they're already full, backing up to the exit, which is going to be blocking the way out again to get to the car parks that are left. Um, you're going to have people queuing up to get in, blocking the exit for people that want to leave. So yes, we need a proper exit off the roundabout for all the car parking at the hospital. I've sat in that car park at, at about four o'clock in the afternoon and it's taken me three quarters of an hour to get from the foot of the slope to back to the entrance to pick up my wife there. There's that much traffic trying to get in and out, which is needlessly held up by the, the, the people coming in and out when you could have an access off the roundabout. Um, and the first, the last thing they've done is they've moved the bus stop or suggesting it to the point furthest that they could from the at day unit, from the new eye centre. Um, by definition, if you're going to the hospital, you're probably not very well. Mm. You've got a long way to come back from, from mm. where it is. So it needs at least another bus stop somewhere or rethink the bus stop because mm. that, is, that is a disastrous move as it stands. One of the other questions riding on for what you said as well is, will there be a sign up saying how many spark parking spaces available? Because if this is full, it needs to be said because some of the problem, like it does at other multi-stories, is you think when you go there, how many spaces, like we have on our car parks, we've got X amount. I think it could be that we have something like that as well to help. You know, these people are either ill or anxious with appointments. I think we may, need to make this as easy a service as we can for everybody. Problem is, I think the difference here, there was no one else, nowhere else to go, if you like. That's why this provides more than, than, than are on, on site now, and obviously it's planned to provide for the new, uh, mm. the, the, the new hospital. I mean, like any multi-story, the barrier will stay down until it's, we, oh. I've, I've queued up at other ones where it's one in, one in, one out. Yeah. Uh, hopefully it won't come to that because it is, I'm, I'm in spaces, is it? Well, yeah, so 
a significant number of spaces and some more than than, than than is there now. So that capacity is planned to be built in. Um, so I think that's slightly different than a town centre where you're coming in and you've got an option to go to different places because everyone is going to the hospital site. So that's why it's, the capacity is slightly increased. Mm -hmm. Are you all right with that answer? Would you like me to uh, comment on the bus stop? At yeah, the moment, the bus stop. And, and, and as I said, unless you bring the rest of the car parking into the line, pay and exit, this is the, going to be the place that everybody wants to go in. And they're not necessarily going to believe the numbers because the numbers always lag behind. Um, I found that in Norwich's car parks where they tell you some of the, the numbers or it's full or empty. Um, and you actually don't believe it. You're going, you find somewhere, but next time you may not. So it's got to be pay on exit for the whole area. And it's not probably that difficult to achieve, surely. Um, yes, yeah, so when when phase one opens, um, there will be more parking than is required because there'll be phase one of the multi-storey and the existing main car park will remain open. So there'll be ample space within the phase one because there's going to be more park car parking than necessary. When phase two begins, the main car park will be defunct. So this will be the only car park. Not, there is no other car park. Um, this will be it. And that's why parking in phase one and two is over and above existing. So it will cater for the, the additional need. Now, in relation to the bus stop relocation, um, which is as you rightly state, it's moved from here to here. This is because the route, the, the route has to be kept clear. There's, there's no other pull-in area for a bus stop. So um, it has to be kept clear for the, the ambulances. So it, it can't go on, on this route. There's nowhere to pull in on this route and therefore that is actually the closest place where a car a bus stop can be provided. Did you wish to come back on that? I would then propose that we defer yeah. this yeah. until they find a better solution for the bus stop. Mm. Do you have a second of that proposal? No, we carry on the debate. <clears throat> Anything else to add, Tash, now? No. Right, I've got Council Rives now. Thank you, Chair. I do feel that uh, discussion, that's the beauty or otherwise, of the multi-story car park apart, we're really having the wrong discussion. We're accepting the point that you know, the hospital must be located here. Everyone in this room, everyone in Kingston wants a new hospital, but we've all failed to have any sort of debate as to where that hospital should be. I'm now, sorry. I, 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 if I can just... I, no, I'm going to... Finish. No, let okay, me I'm finish. I'm, here because no, if, I'm, if I, excuse me, I have the floor. I was going to say, we are discussing what's in front of us, yeah, not I'm, alternatives. I know, and I'm going to discuss what's in front of us. And the only reason to accept this building is because we've been railroaded into a situation where only one site has been considered. And therefore, you know, it's impossible to reject it, however ugly it was or anything like that. But it is the case that as a borough, you know, if this is built, we're absolutely committed to the site. And I'm not aware of any serious work being done to give any consideration to alternative sites, which do exist. And I'll say one thing, when then I'll, and I'll stop. I was brought up in Kingston Thames, in, in Surrey, uh, opposite to Kingston Hospital. And they rebuilt Kingston Hospital for much of my childhood. And one thing we all noticed was that the Kingston Hospital, there was no choice, it had to be rebuilt there. But the combination of bulldozers and ambulances is absolutely catastrophic. The chief executive pointed out that this is a complex operation for them to do, that it is absolutely a jigsaw. And, you know, getting all these little bits to fit together is enormously difficult. And that's why it just baffles me that one is not looking at a greenfield site where we know these sites exist, which would be much, much quicker, and I believe much less expensive. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Well, members, we are debating what's in front of us, what, nothing else. This is what's on the table. This is what's proposed. Other alternatives are not in the frame at all because they've not come forward. This is what it is. Um, who? Councillor Holmes now, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I've got a point of clarification. The 
The Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service, whilst not objecting, spend an awful lot of time explaining some of the problems and difficulties um, about building car parks uh, and referring to a, 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 a catastrophic uh, fire in a Liverpool multi-storey. Am I right to suppose, because there appears to be no uh, reference to it in, in the following sections um, about the planning considerations and so forth, am I right in saying that the issues that are raised by the fire service are actually uh, a downstream issue rather than one which the planners need to um, to, to to reference. Um, yes. Yeah, so in relation to that, their, their main concern was with the electric vehicle charging bays, and as originally proposed, the multi-storey car park was going to have electric vehicle charging points um, within the building. That was their their main issue of of concern, those electric vehicle charging points now are to be mm -hmm. conditioned and they will be provided elsewhere, the conditions. Uh, elsewhere on mm -hmm. site. Additionally, we have a, uh, a water tank here, et cetera, for, um, for fire and all the other issues are covered by building regulations and are not planning matters. That's what yeah, saying. so it's condition 11 and 12 for that. Yeah, thanks. When it uh, talks uh, on page 60. Yes, it was, it was the ones on page 53. There's several items which are yeah, well, that's, to do with the EV charging. Yeah, but well, that's now been explained and I'm happy with Yeah, that. as we went further along in the detail of this report, that's where it got picked up and answered for you. Um, what else was there? Sorry, have you got a new point, Councillor? Right. The Wallen, or yeah, no, Councillor Diwali, then I'll have Lord. Thank you, Chair. Just to refer to um, Councillor Holmes' point on the EV charge spaces, um, it's the, was it only 18 are envisaged, um, given that the intention is that um, that there was it by 2035, all new cars will be electric vehicles, um, and the expected lifetime of a of a well, internal combustion car is about eight years, whereas an electric car is 15 to 20 years at the moment. Um, we will have during the lifetime of this car park um, an expected shift to almost exclusively electric vehicles. So the question is, um, are, it's, it's uh, what has been envisaged to um, accommodate more electric vehicles in the future during the lifetime of this car park? Thank you. And the, uh, there's another question I've got to this. Has the weight of these new vehicles that are electric because of the batteries are heavier been taken into consideration in this application? Yes, I mean, on the building regulations and that structural engineers reports will um, mm -hmm. go with that. The 18 um, spaces we think is is adequate. Obviously battery life by then will be will, will, will be longer, hopefully. Um, and you know, you, you won't put a petrol station at every car park to charge up a petrol car, would you? So, so there is, there is adequate, I think we feel, charging um, available there. The 18 charges, we feel that, 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 that that's in there. Right. Councillor Lawton. Yeah. That's... So, Lawton, could you put your microphone on, please? Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'd like to go back to the bus stops. Um, Natasha said that there was nowhere else. To put it, but I think there's a better place. I'll just show you on the plan if you could bring that up. I would inform, I would inform you, Councillor, that we're not here to while well, you make that proposal. I've got we've got to make a decision based on what's in front of us because it puts on page 60 the third paragraph down. The applicant has confirmed that the relocated bus stop, which is now at the entrance, has been agreed with local bus operators. The location was chosen because it does not affect blue light zones, drop off zones, or cause disruption amongst, amongst the site. So that is why we have it where we is. Obviously, they've given consideration, but there's other things in the mix when they made it. Right, a uh, council story. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The um, issue is obviously, I don't suppose there's too many of us like multi-story car parks, to be honest, probably how they look. 
and what they end up like, to be fair. But um, having said that, land is at so much of a premium. Seemingly upward seems to be the only way in certain aspects. This particular car park and its design and so forth, to me, doesn't look too bad. Um, I must say that, um, to compared with some others. Um, I must say, Madam Chairman, I couldn't agree more um, with Councillor Long as regards the 98 disabled spaces being just under 8%. Um, I do believe that's unfortunate there isn't more, um, to be fair, on the ground floor. Um, I think these obviously, as, as Councillor Long said, the people attending these hospitals are probably people who need this type of car park, a disability car park to a certain extent. So therefore, you know, I'm disappointed probably that there's only probably the minimum amount of 7.88% of required. The other thing is, Madam Chair, um, being in farming, um, when I build a building, five years' time has never big enough. Mm, that's right. The damn thing is too small. <laughs> so I'm just wondering when phase two is completed, is this car park going to be big enough? Because I just can't help feeling at the time, as that seems a lot and all the rest of it, but five or ten years' time, I don't very much whether that will be big enough, unfortunately, for a hospital. Mm. So that's, that's just a concern I have, Madam Chairman. Apart from that, as I'm sure that we've all said, mm. we're all in favour of a new QE hospital on the site there, or some of us on the site, some not. The fact is that, Madam Chairman, this is part of, pro hopefully, a forward plan, yeah. looking at that. So obviously, I'm all in favour. Thank you. Thank you. I have nothing else on the table. We've had a good debate. I'm now going to take to the vote. The recommendation here is to approve. Wendy. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bauer. Four. Councillor Budd. Four. Councillor Holmes. Four. Councillor Howland. Four. Councillor Hudson. Four. Councillor Lawton. Four. Councillor Manning. Four. Councillor Knuckles. Four. Councillor Parrish. Four. Councillor Mrs. Viking. Four. Councillor Story. Four. Councillor Tyler. Four. Councillor Diwali. Four. Councillor Whitby. Four. Councillor Long. Four. Councillor Rose. Four. And Councillor Rives. Absolutely. That's carried, Chairman. Thank you. Right. Well, that recommendation to approve is carried. Right, members. We're now moving on to page 71, which is MNIF. Um, it's a hybrid application because we border it, obviously, with Fenland. And it's a full application. And the recommendation here is that we... The planning committee devolves its decision-making authority to Fend and Council in respect of cross-boundary applications. Who's doing that one? Keith? Right. Sorry, Brian. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Members, hello. Um, the application in front of you today is a cross-boundary application. So it's one of two, um, which are duplicated one goes to Fenland District Council and one goes to ourselves as the, uh, the neighbouring authority. There is a difference in terms of the, the site area and uh, the responsibilities involved. We just move on to the next screen. That's the, the site in its totality, which is about 12 hectares. And this screen will now show the border in between the two authorities. So uh, there's Sandy Lane to the north of the site, wraps around here to Broad End Road, and then Green Lane comes southwards and then across to the east. So the area within our control is this area here. If you can follow the, the cursor. So it's this, this area in there like so, and there's a, a portion of the, the site to the south, which is to be remain uh, undeveloped and, and part of the um, amenity area, uh, green space. So in this locality, we've got housing, and then there is an outline proposal to the, uh, the north in the, the corner of Sandy Lane. It's an outline proposal with our, our patch for a 60 bed house, uh, 60 bed care home and a community hub consisting of uh, village shops, community facilities with flats above. Um, within this area, this portion of land as we see, um, 
within our particular area. Um, there is also 50, approximately 59 houses of a, a total of uh, 325. So roughly 18% of the, uh, the housing um, falls within our patch. Um, Policy-wise, this is inset um, F3, which is the, uh, the Wisbitch Fringe. You see it's an allocated site. Portion involved with us is from this part here, like so, in purple. And this is the broad concept plan, which was agreed by uh, both authorities in conjunction with uh, trying to, to get a, a route forward to um, have a, a broad brush approach to how the, the scheme could be um, um, actually developed going forward. So you can see there is the hub in this uh, locality here roughly in the centre of the site. And these are sort of desire lines around it. There's public footpaths from east-west here. And again, here, like so. And then you've got green space to the south, which is once again part of the, uh, the equation. So these are just some rough examples of the, uh, the street scene. And we've got some computer-generated imagery. So this is our patch again. Uh, but this is an outline, so we're just looking at the principle basically at this point. And the full application details are the, the housing in this locality, which are here just a second for a different viewpoint. So they're the ones within our patch. So the recommendation uh, before you today is for devolution of the um, decision making of power to the Fanon District Council. They have, as I say, 80% of the site and they have got the fee associated with the development. Um, they have also consulted us on their application, which uh, we'd respond to in conjunction with the uh, debate today. Mm -hmm. So all the views we've had uh, currently will be forwarded on to Fenham District Council in order to make the, uh, the decision on the development. Just to put you in context with the, um, the site itself, just to show it, the Sandy Lane in the distance, we're, we're taking these as a viewpoints from Green Lane. So the road squeaks around here, and this is Broad End Road. Um, the other gang goes off to the, um, the junction with the A47 to the east, uh, just panning round. This is the, the footpath link, the northernmost footpath link across the site. You can see it's agricultural land both sides. This is further down uh, towards the southern part of the site, and uh, that's uh, the existing property called Cross, White Cross. So we're looking uh, westwards there across the site, and then just panning around north again, just to show it's open arable land. Uh, likewise, from that viewpoint, and there is the other footpath link which runs east-west across the site. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Well, I'm going to start with this one because I live nearest this uh, particular development, living in Upwell, and I can state that reading this recommendation from the local highway authority, no recommendation, lack of information. So Norfolk County Council Highways unable to make a recommendation. National Highways recommend not determined for a specific period. And why is that? Because it's so dangerous, this broad end junction. How many years have we been talked about and we haven't got it upgraded? There is a desperate need for a roundabout here. We've had deaths, we've had accidents, we've had people taking chances. How many more lives need to be lost at this junction before we get it sorted? This needs to be done before anything goes in there with more housing, more challenges and more accidents. It's a 60 mile an hour there. And let's face it, not everybody does 60. They don't. And they go here and along, and you can turn to the left or peel to the right. But either way, time and again, we've asked for road improvements there, and we get fobbed off. Well, how much longer are we going to get fobbed off before this is done? So I'm sorry, I'm not in favour of this application because of what's happening. We've got to defer to Finland. Well, I hope they're listening because we in West Norfolk think we've got to get something done. And it's our residents who use this road and travellers and people from away. And I'm sorry, but we need to have a better response and a stronger action taken on this before anything's done about it. I hope you're listening. Yeah, 
Yes, thank you very much. Uh, you've taken the words almost out of my mouth there, Chairman. Um, when we defer to others, if we defer to county, we make a recommendation on what we consider before we defer to county. In this case, we're deferring an application across to a neighbour or authority. And it's quite right. I mean, there's more properties within their patch than there is within ours. I used to represent Walsokan before they changed the boundaries and ended up with two member wards where we used to have single members and so on. But um, so I know Broad End Road Junction. I've actually speaking, I've actually speaking to people on their doorsteps to find, you know, that they'd lost loved ones on Broad End Road Junction. And anything that considers putting more traffic through that location has to be taken into consideration by both Fenland District Council in their determination of this but also Cambridgeshire County Highways, as well as Norfolk County Highways and, and, and Highways England, or whatever they're currently called this week, National Highways or something. They'll probably change again next week. Um, but the bottom line is Broad End Road Junction is dangerous. Green Lane that was mentioned, I mean, that comes to a dead end stop that you can actually walk across the A47 at that point. Now, I don't know many people that do it regularly, but I've done it and it's blooming dangerous. There's a bit of a curve on the road there, um, but I've done it. Um, just just to look at drainage issue that was both sides of both sides of the A47. So you've got you've got to make this representation to Fenland. I'm sure they're aware of it. I mean, my understanding was that when we had a Peterborough, uh, Cambridgeshire, and Peterborough combined authority, um, that, that that was on their radar to put a, a roundabout in at this location, even though it was in Norfolk. But obviously, we were part of that uh, uh, local enterprise partnership, and so funding was supposedly uh, in the in the mix for that. With the change of uh, political direction within Cambridgeshire and um, within the um, combined authority, that seems to have just disappeared off the radar. But actually, if you go into Wisbridge and drive about Wisbridge, I think the maintenance of their roads has gone off their radar in any case. So I would suggest that yes, we we defer as it says but we make those representations as strongly as we possibly can because we don't want any more of my residents that have to cross Broad End Road Junction from Marsh and St. James to get to get out um, on at the 47 at that point to end up in the position that where others but we've lost. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, thank you. I, I fully concur with your uh, concerns uh, that have been raised and, and that can be um, sent on accordingly. And that's the purpose of this to to gauge your reaction and to, to act like a, a parish council would effectively with our norm planning applications. So any objections or concerns you, you raise will be sent on. But the as a separate issue, the Cambridgeshire County Council have been looking in conjunction with our own uh, Norfolk County Council as to get in um, highway improvements to serve Wisbeach. Um, we're looking at uh, a roundabout possibility at this particular road junction, which you referred to. And land acquisition is already on, in place, I believe, and things are moving forward on that, likewise with Elm High Road. So we've been consulted on, on both of these schemes and will continue to be so. Um, but if there's any comfort there um, for you, that there are wheels in motion to address these two quite dangerous and congested road junctions, which uh, are causing problems and congestion for the town. Um, and it's not something that's been looked at lightly and there are solutions in the pipeline. Particular um, site, that's been going since 2016, Keith. How long does it take to have a discussion if it was mine, you know how the speed I work, that'd be sorted. But we keep talking and talking in circles, and surely by now we can come something that's formulated. I think it's just general frustration that that um, B and Q roundabout, as I call it, up at Whiz Beach, Elm High Road, and this other one, they've been proposed, they've been taken away, they've been lobbied, they've been taken away. Only a fortnight ago, it was somebody in the papers highlighting it again it's just general frustration for everybody who has to use that road and the parlour state of it as well now i've got councillor parish thank you chair uh, i'm glad chair that you uh, acknowledge that uh, where there's dangerous junctions you need improvements and a roundabout 
Um, I was going to uh, raise the issue of the local highway authority as well, where it says no recommendation. I would have thought if they've got a lack of information and some concern, it should have been a refusal, not a, not a lack of information um, and no recommendation at all. I think they seem to be um, deferring their, their responsibilities. Um, I note that also from Parish Council have got um, strong reasons to be concerned about this application. Um, and my only concern is by de deferring to a, another um, another planning authority, do we, we do we lose some impact really? I mean, should should we not represent the people who live in the part of the area which is concerned here, which is about um, 50 or 60 houses, I think, it's, it's still within uh, this borough. Um, if we if we come to the end of our debate, can we say we refuse this because of highways grounds? And does that carry forward? Or can there be a, a joint uh, declaration? I mean, why do we defer to the neighboring council? Why isn't this a, a joint representation? Why don't we have a, a refusal from us and then they can decide what they want to do? I don't know. Right, we'll just get you an answer. Right. Can we have an answer, please? Yeah, yeah. it's on page 77. On page 77, apparently. Give me a minute. So Is it to do with the fees? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's all the paragraph. Yeah, paragraph. yeah. As it, yeah, it says, although there's no set guidance on dealing with such applications, the latter course of action is not recommended as it does not promote a coordinated approach to development management and may result in inconsistency in terms of conditions, obligations, or indeed where one authority recommends approval and the other re refusal, et cetera. That's taken from planning practice guidance. Yeah. Um, I understand, because they are difficult. I mean, obviously, we don't get a fee for this. The fee goes to Fenland because they're the larger authority. 80% of the application. Um, and obviously, they've got the vast majority of the application. But what you can do is 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 raise concerns. And if you've got serious concerns, and we, we know the Broad End Road Junction has to be brought up to standard before uh, development takes place. I understand things are fairly advanced on that. And we like to report that to the inspector in a new local plan. Uh, and national highways have been involved because it's, it's a trunk road. There's a temporary track, track regulation order that has now been granted. Fenland tell us that's funding for that, those those works have been secured and in place. Uh, but I would suggest from what you said that you, your view is that you object unless those... those um, Could we say that we want to see the infrastructure put in place before we get any new housing going well, on? Absolutely, there? yeah, you can. Because you can, that's what the issue is. Say that. It's, well, I think yeah. I'd like to propose that as a recommendation. Would I have a second to Councillor Long? Yeah, thank you. And then put that as a recommendation to our comments going yeah, forward. Absolutely. You know, do I have to see everybody's view on that as a recommendation, Stuart? Yes. Probably wise getting a general agreement if anyone's happy agreement. with that. Is everybody happy with that? What I've proposed? Yes, agreed. agreed. Right. So I think we've done. Are we done that then? Well, I'll take the recommendation. A, the assistant director, environment and planning, recommends that the planning committee devolves its decision making authority to friend the district council in respect of the cost boundary application. And B, if A is accepted. <coughs> It is also recommended that the comments of Walsoke and Parish Council, along with other comments raised by statutory consultees, interested parties, plus any additional views of this committee, including our recommendation, are to be forwarded to Fenlon District Council for them to take into account in the decision-making process. This will also constitute the response to consultation sought by Fenlon District Council in relation to the application number that's in this recommendation under their application 22 stroke 02080 stroke com. Are we happy with that? Agreed? Agreed. 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 Is that all right, Stuart? No, right. Fine. We'll, we'll do that without right. with with adding addition. Thank right. You. I think we've done that one then. We're now we're on to, where are we? Where are we, Stuart? Ah, next one, another interesting one. Um, page 81, it's Walsoken, Marston St. James. It's the installation, operation, and decommissioning of a solar farm, a major development. There's late correspondence and speakers, and the recommendation here is approved. 
Right. Thank you, Chairman. I'll do this one in, uh, in Lorna's absence. Oh, hello. Okay, so we're basically looking at, um, at one half of, of the site here. It's split um, by Harps Hall, Hall Road, which is identified by um, my little uh, red cursor here. So one side of the site and, and the other. It's plan and permission sought for approximately 125,000 gram mounted solar panels and a battery energy storage system uh, and associated infrastructure. Uh, you'll note um, from the presentation shortly that the panels uh, would rise to approximately 3.1 metres at the highest point and that the capacity um, of the electricity capacity of the overall um, development would not exceed 49.9 megawatts, hence it's uh, determined by the local authority. And that all cabling from the site to the substation would be installed uh, underground and would then be fed into uh, the national grid network. The proposal um, also uh, has various different bits of infrastructure, including a 2.5 metre perimeter deer fence with additional three metre high palisade fencing uh, around the proposed battery and substation compounds. And also boundary uh, planting is proposed, which I'll take you through uh, shortly um, in uh, on presentation. Uh, CCTV cameras are also proposed um, with poles measuring up to 3.3 metres in site and face into the site. Uh, there is no lighting. Uh, and the application is approximately 87 hectares, of which the solar panels and associated works would cover approximately 33 hectares. And the remaining 54 hectare hectares dedicated to biodiversity enhancements and 0.9 hectares of bramble scrub to be retained. You'll, know, you'll also note that no uh, Grade 1 agricultural land um, is proposed to be used, as it mounts to effectively 3A and 3B with small pockets um, of Grade 2 agricultural uh, land. Uh, the proposal is for um, what is known in solar panel terms is a, as a temporary 30-year operational period, and it would be fully decommissioned and site uh, restored. Uh, and you'll note from the, the pack that the, uh, the development is an EIA development, i.e. Uh, infrastructure, sorry, environmental impact assessment development and an environmental statement has been submitted. So if we just look to the plan, I'll stare at this screen here because I've got a few little um, bits to look at. So this is to the northwest of Harps Hall and then um, to the southeast you have the, the further area of development. And again, this is the, heart, the southwestern um, area of the site. A less populated area, um, uh, as you all know. So here we have um, the effectively the layout of, of the overall scheme. The, the blue areas are obviously the, the solar panels, um, with green areas being maintained as existing um, existing planting um, and existing uh, uh, features within the site. There's also um, a landscape buffer, five metre uh, landscape buff buffer all the way uh, around the site which is not visible to you in the naked eye, but it is um, here on this plan. And you can just about see actually it kinks out um, here. So that's your brown area. Um, a hedge line proposed uh, along this area here, which will be um, both trees um, and hedge line, which is a, a new feature you'll see from the photos uh, in a minute. And then you have the battery um, storage containers and substation switch gear in this area. On the, um, on the northwestern part of the site. Uh, and you also have um, a, a temporary um, compound here, which is a temporary construction compound as identified. Uh, there's also an evergreen hedgerow um, proposed. There are most uh, native hedgerows proposed, but an evergreen hedgerow uh, in this location here. And then on the southwest, um, again, you have temporary construction compound B. Again, there's a um, five metre buffer proposed, landscape buffer proposed all the way uh, around the site, as you can see uh, here. Okay. So these are indicative sections of the um, solar array details. Again, you can see that maximum height of, of 3.1 meters and the tilt at uh, 20 degrees. Uh, and here you have the um, typical battery storage details, which effectively look like a, a container. 
and uh, the security fencing at uh, three meters high and obviously the, um, the uh, CCTV, as you can see here at 3.3. Uh, and the transformer housing, which will effectively look like um, uh, bits of kit within the, uh, within the landscape, but obviously screened by the, the buffer treatments. So here we're looking uh, north along Harps Hall Road um, from in front of Poplar Farm, which is off to your right. And uh, southwest of Poplar Farm from the access point to uh, the northwest parcel of the site, which is over here. And the Poplar Farm bungalow with southeast parcel to the site to the rear. And again, uh, from Harp southeast site from Harpswell Road, <coughs> south of Poplar Farm bungalow, as you see, it's generally farmed. And view westwards from Harpswell Road at the access point um, to the northwest parcel of the site. So the application site is identified by the, um, the arrow. And then view south on Hartswell Road, so both um, Farm Mir Dyke Farm and Lidwood. So the, um, the site will be off to the right and to the left here. And then north of Mir Dyke Farm at Hartswell Road. And then within um, the uh, Mir Dyke Farm itself. And the site lines li lies, sorry, beyond the poplars to the rear, which are identified here. And then here from, this is the most open, very probably far from a public road, uh, northwest from Cow Lake Drove, which is the northwest parcel of the site. And as previously explained, you'd have a new proposed hedgerow planting in this location, along with tree planting. And again, uh, the, the north from Cow Lake Drove. And that's uh, the view to the northwest from the junction of Harps Hall Road with Station Road and Cow Lake Drove. So they would be over in this area here. And northeast towards the south um, east parcel of land from the junction of Harps Hole, sorry, Harps Hall Road and Station Road and Cow Lake Drove. There's more landscaping in this area than there is um, to the northwest. Okay, so issues are outlined on your agenda pages on page 82. It is recommended for approval, uh, and the Sports Planning Committee is the parish council objects to proposed development. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Could I have Malcolm Steed, please? Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Malcolm Stead and I live on Harps Hall Road. I'm representing the residents who are against this proposal. Our concerns about the project are many and varied. But in a nutshell, it's a wrong development in the wrong location for the wrong reasons by the wrong developer. Down in LLP are an investor with minimal experience of developing projects of this scale. The study of their submission mix is pretty clear. In the first instance, they say the development has been designed to extract the maximum possible energy from the land. This is fundamentally not true. 49.9 megawatts is a political calculation it's not a practical calculation. Their assertion that the site can be constructed in 34 weeks with just 20 people is beyond laughable. And their also assertion that these, these people would be local shows a complete lack of understanding of the skills, experience and qualifications that are needed to build a project like this. Their argument about the quality of your land is completely spurious. The surrounding land is predominantly owned by the same landowner, and yet it's growing wheat at the moment. A, a cynic would suggest that the landowner's switch from food to energy crops was driven by future plans for the land. Either way, as these fields stand, they can be returned to food production by the turn of a plough, not waiting 30 years for some potential decommissioning. And who can say where we will be in 30 years? Six months ago, the experts were predicting we would suffer power cuts. They didn't happen. But no one predicted the empty shelves at the supermarkets, which did happen. Remember, we can produce electricity in the North Sea, and we can produce electricity on the top of Tesco's roof, but we can't grow potatoes there. 
And the clearest evidence that the developer has no understanding of the nature of the scale of this project is his traffic management plan. How can any experienced, competent developer repeatedly claim that a project that requires well in excess of 20,000 tonnes of plant equipment materials will only need 100 HGVs? A half sensible assessment of this information in this submission confirms that at least 2,500 HGV trips will be required down Harps Hall Road that you saw. These figures are pretty well corroborated by reviewing similar sites that you've already judged on in this area. Sedgeford Solar Farm is less than half the size of this scheme. They calculated 1,538 HGV movements with 50 or 60 men on site. The Rose and Crown Solar Farm is about half this size. They calculated 458 HGV vehicles. And if you speak to the residents close to that, they're already saying there are way more than that. Gunthorpe Road Solar Farm, is smaller in size to this, and they calculate over 1,084 HGV uh, deliveries with 60 to 70 men on site. How can we possibly have confidence that this developer will be able to keep our children, our horses, our cyclists, our disabled users safe when they have absolutely no idea of the scale of the work that they are proposing to partake on? <laughs> Council, you're doing great things in this area. You're following a rapid programme of decarbonisation, Council asset of decarbonizing council assets, solar panels appearing on thousands of domestic roofs, helped along by council initiatives like Solar Together and Norfolk Warm Homes. You're taking a responsible approach to planning applications for private solar installations on commercial roofs and private green spaces, and it is initiatives that will reduce our carbon emissions, but ensure that local people and local businesses are the ones that will reap the benefit of the cheaper and more sustainable energy. But this project isn't that. This project is not about energy security or sustainability or decarbonisation or God forbid cheaper energy for your constituents. It's about an out of town landowner using an out of town developer to employ out of town workers from an out of town contractor with out of town materials and out of town plant and equipment. The only reason this site has been chosen is because this is the land that this landowner owns. Large solar farms do not provide cheaper electricity for the public. They merely generate excellent returns on investments for the corporations that fund them. This developer has cynically manipulated the planning process to specifically avoid scrutiny at national government level. He has artificially and falsely calculated the generation capacity that is 0.1 megawatt below the threshold requiring assessment as a product of, as a project of national significance. Thank you. Can I just finish this sentence, no, please? I'm sorry, but you've had your time the same as the others will get. Indeed, I've indeed. I've got to be fair to everybody. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you. That was not uh, No, I'm sorry. Thank you. Trust you. Uh, who's next? Um, Victoria sure. Meek, please. Can we have the mic on, please? Sorry, that'll help. Start again. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Vicky Meek. I've been asked together with Malcolm to represent the residents who are against this proposal. There are many reasons why we object to this project, but as I only have five minutes, I will only focus on concerns about the battery storage facility. I live at Black Duck Farm, one of the properties nearest this proposed installation with my partner, and three small children. We run a transport business from the property and often have vaporized fuel tankers, which are parked in the yard. It's true to say I am frightened. Down in LLP are an investor with minimal experience of developing projects such as this. Their website confirms that their total ground mounted solar farm portfolio is limited to about 11 sites, averaging four megawatts each. The largest being less than a fifth of the size of this one. More significantly, one of these micro farms includes a battery storage facility. Downings have failed to provide any substantial details around the best, not even its plant capacity, the number, type, or the chemical makeup of the batteries he intends to use. It's almost as if the developer has decided to add B, uh, B 
B-E-S-S, -S, as an afterthought. He claims to have carried out a comprehensive visual impact survey around the site, but has ignored the BESS, focusing purely on the solar arrays. Not once does he mention the size or location of the BESS, which consists of numerous 12 meter long solid steel structures that stand 4.8 meters above the ground. That's taller than my house. They will be visible as a blot on the landscape from every vantage point of this site. He's totally failed to address the noise levels that will be generated by the BESS. He has said that he has situated it far enough away from residents for it not to be an issue. In contrast, the developer, Cambridge Power, of the best proposal at Saddlebow, understood the problem, has recognised the impacts his design will have on residents and has commissioned a full noise assessment. The report recognises that properties 340 metres away will still be subjected to an ambient noise level of 30 decibels. As such, and as such have designed a noise attenuation barrier around the best, no such measures have been incorporated into the de design at Meerdyke. Most worryingly, the developer has shown a complete lack of understanding of the safety issues and hazards already identified with battery storage. Unlike Cambridge Power, he has not even consulted Norfolk Fire and Rescue or Anglian Water. The fire service have stated they recognise there are significant hazards with new and emerging technology, and they expressed a wish to work with the developer to develop safe strategies. But here we have a developer who has no experience or understanding of the issues. How can they play a pro proactive part in protecting us? The fire service have listed several key elements the best design should incorporate. These are adequate separation, the design has crammed 10 containers and a transformer into only 390 square metres. That's 275 square metres of steel buildings into, into a compound of only 390 square metres. Sufficient water, they suggest the flow rate of 1,900 litres per minute for a two hour period. That's 2,208,000 2 litres of water. The best at Saddlebow is situated next to the river. This one is situated at the end of the lane with water pressure so low it can take a minute to fill a kettle. And yet Anglia and water haven't been consulted. Safe access for fire appliances to manoeuvre. Clearly there is none. Measures to prevent contamination of water course. Any fire runoff complete with toxic chemicals will flow directly into the main drain on Cow Lake Road. Due consideration to the prevailing winds. Three properties closest to the best, the A47 and Walsh Open, are all in a direct line of the prevailing winds, the flames and toxic fumes they would bring with them. The design of this best is woefully inadequate. Later, you will be reviewing, reviewing the submission by Cambridge Power for the best at Saddlebow. The contrast is stark. The residents close to this development are frightened. We do not trust that this developer has the experience or capability of delivering a battery storage facility that will not put our health and welfare at risk. The development will quite literally be on our doorsteps. I do not want my children playing within a couple of hundred metres of this ticking time bomb, would you? Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for coming. And now I also have Fraser Blackwood, please. Okay. Yes. Good afternoon, councillors. Thank you for affording us this opportunity to speak in support of this application. My name is Fraser Blackwood and I'm a director with JLL Planning and Property Consultancy with specific experience in renewable energy consumption. The applicant, to clarify, down in renewables development are an experienced and trusted renewables developer and currently manage over 400 megawatts of installed energy capacity across the UK and Nordics. As a developer and an operator, Downing are committed to investment in the local area and creating long-term relationships with communities. The core team that have been involved in the project from the outset and are present here today will oversee the construction and operation of the development, providing consistency in project planning and delivery. The development itself would provide enough clean energy to power approximately 12 to 14,000 average UK homes, and the benefits of solar development of this scale are unmistakable. Planning policy support, support at national level through the MPPF and at local level through your own development plan offer strong support and principle for such development. This proposal will contribute to the UK's legally obligated energy and climate change targets 
as well as playing a longer term strategic role in enhancing energy security and associated pricing instabilities. The site is unique in that it facilitates a substantial energy output with rel relatively few associated impacts, providing an extremely efficient and sustainable use of land. Critical to the policy assessment process here and the fundamental basis of your policy is DM20, Renewable Energy, CSO8, Sustainable Development, is whether the clear benefits of the development are outweighed by potential impacts identified. In short, is this the right development in the right place? In answering that question, we'd like to highlight some of the central principles of the proposed development, which we consider demonstrate that benefits do not just outweigh the potential adverse impacts, but significantly outweigh them. Of course, all this has to be considered in the context of the recognised climate emergency, which should be afforded significant weight in that planning balance and decision making. Firstly, and importantly, the application site was not chosen at random. The applicant invests significant time and resources in screening and prioritising appropriate sites for renewable energy provision, fully considering potential amenity, land use and environmental effects from a project outset. As part of progressing the design proposals at this site, the applicant also carried out a robust pre-planning process with the planning authority, engaged directly with West Walton Paris Council and attended a community consultation event at West Walton Village Hall in August last year. Detailed feedback on the initial design proposals was gathered across those consultation, analysed and taken into consideration where possible in the design development. For example, by reducing the overall panel height, ensuring appropriate buffers to residential properties, and providing appropriate boundary treatment to mitigate visual effects. Clearly, with the development of this nature in this environment, there will always be a landscape and visual change, and this has been fully considered through a robust environmental impact assessment, which has informed the design process, ultimately minimising the extensive effects through appropriate visual screening and planting. Furthermore, no significant effects on biodiversity have been identified through the EIA, and appropriate improvement measures will be delivered. This comprises over 54 hectares of biodiversity enhancement, with features such as hedgerows, providing habitats for birds, bats and badgers, traditional orchards, providing foraging and nesting, roosting habitat for breeding birds and roosting bats, and wildflower rich planting, providing nectar for pollinators. We would highlight, highlight that the site is currently used to grow crops which, crops which are sent to an anaerobic digester located over 20 miles away to produce biogas. It is not therefore considered that the proposed development will have an impact on food security, and indeed an extended fallow period through the operational phase of the solar farm will enable a long-term recovery of the soil health. In this unique instance, it's considered that proposed development therefore presents a sustainable energy solution on the site, making more efficient use of the land available and providing betterment in response to the recognised climate emergency. This without significantly compromising the overall supply of prime agricultural land in the locality or wider region. In light of the above, above and the report before you today from officers, it's clear that the proposed development responds favourably to your council's established development plan policy facilitating a transition to a low carbon economy. Beyond this, the development will have a positive impact on the local economy with the implementation of community benefit contributions and a commit commitment by the applicant to utilize the local workforce to develop, construct and operate the project during its lifespan. In this instance, it considers that the benefits significantly outweigh the potential adverse effects of the development. And it's clear that the site is capable of facilitating this imperative energy infrastructure. We would respectfully therefore request that you support the officer recommendation and approve the application. Thank you for coming. Um, who's doing that? Ew, Hannah, have you got anything to add? Right, well then I'm just going to ask for some clarification on a comment you made, because you said about no lighting. But on page 83, fifth paragraph down, you talk about passive infrared centre lighting will be installed, lighting can be conditioned, which is 8 and 10. Is that correct? So could you just expand on that statement saying not lighting? Because I think you'll find there is. What's the difference between passive and light? Really? All oh, right. Well, I don't know. It could. Well, then why have we conditioned it? You see? Yeah. So, and the other thing is the uh, Malcolm Steed spoke about the lorry movements coming in and out of other applications. Why is there so less transportation considering this is twice as large? Um, well, it, it's, it's a good point, but obviously the TA has been assessed by the County Council. They thoroughly assess the, um, the, the figures within that report um, and they raise no objection to it. Um, they, it clearly states on page 107, consider the information, do not, set, uh, do not object, consider that the submitted transport statement has, uh, has made a thorough assessment of the proposed haul route uh, to be utilised during the construction period and agree with the assessment. 
Right. And the last one is it says the export capacity would not exceed 49.9, which is 0.1 of a megawatt. How come that they can be so precise? I would like to know what's the tipping point if it's 50, because it doesn't come to us. So how do we do this? You're right. We do seem to get quite a few that are 49.9 and, and the threshold is 50 yeah. megawatts before it becomes a, yeah. a an infrastructure project and therefore not dealt with by the local authority. So, yeah, that, that is, I think it's pretty obvious. It's just under that, under that threshold, 50 megawatts. Right. Anyway, I've got Councillor Parish first and then Councillor Long. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I'd like to Thank congratulate you. the first two public speakers who summed up concerns remarkably well and covered them all. Um, I too looked at the, uh, the company in question and found that um, they rely on 10 investment funds to actually uh, uh, support them and their, their prime reason for existence is to maximise the profit for their shareholders, as most businesses are. Um, solar farms um, work most effectively, of course, when the sun shines, which is in the summer. And in the summer, uh, the UK is a net exporter of electricity, and electricity from most solar farms in the summer is sold on the open market and exported across to, to Europe and elsewhere. They don't benefit local houses. They're not plugged into a local house or anything like that. It's, it just goes on the international market. The best place for solar panels is on the roofs of houses because it benefits the inhabitants of the people who live there. It doesn't benefit a shareholder, it benefits the people who have the um, solar, solar panels on their roofs. Now this land, 58% um, well, of it is good or better farming land and could be used uh, for crops. An argument is made that currently it's used to grow crops for biodigestion and energy production, and therefore there's no net loss of, of farming land. Well, I voted against um, growing crops for biodigestion because I think farming land should be used for growing crops for people to eat. Um, we're all full of the uh, woes of energy production and the um, decarbonisation and um, the impact of uh, the Ukraine war and so on on energy production. But at the end of the day, we can produce, as the first speaker said, energy from other sources. Um, we can't produce food from other sources. We produce that from the farmland uh, that we have. I predict that um, uh, the shortages we've noticed recently will expand in five years, they'll be quite serious. In your grandchildren's time, they'll be um, having rations, quite honestly, because the world's population is growing, climate is changing, and there's greater demand from all our imports, the food importing sources for that, that food to be provided elsewhere. Um, if you want reasons for refusal, the CPRE given a great load on page 96. Um, and the last comment is uh, this business about the number of... Uh, vehicles being used to uh, uh, create this, this proposal. And the Norfolk County Council highways have said that uh, there's no problem because there's been a traffic assessment. Well, I don't know about the veracity of this particular traffic assessment, but we all know that traffic assessments are done by developers and presented to the NCC highways, and they're all accepted because it's done by people who do traffic assessments. Whether they're correct or not, it is left to us to decide. And I would suggest from the information given by the first two speakers that there's questions to be asked about those traffic assessments. So all in all, um, the last point is to remind you that in the last two applications for solar farms, I believe it was the last two, this uh, committee voted against those. And I know we deal with every application on its own merit, but there is some consistency in refusing this one. Thank you. Right, Councillor Parish, what you said about the refusal, are you proposing? Yeah. Uh, right. D and the planning reason is? Oh. Like that. I have to. Oh. Wait a minute. Well, I can come back to you, but I need it. You've, you've brought it up in your conversation. So that's why I'm asking you. And also, do you have a second there? Yeah. yeah, well, I, I know that, but I still want to know the planning Councilor reasons. Long. Councillor Long, can you, have you got any planning reasons? I'm going to take you as the well, seconder. I'm quite surprised that um, Councillor Parrish has jumped in and uh, said that this ought to be refused. I mean, I absolutely agree with him, and the, I'm surprised because we hardly ever agree on, on anything, anything. <laughs> which, is, which is quite amazing. But... Um, 
I mean, I've represented Marshland, and I'm absolutely—I find it surprising that Marshland Parish Council actually support this. It's uh, the loss of agricultural land that's well, part that, of the that, issue. That is that is the real crux of it for me. But there's yeah. there's an additional thing, and it's about amenity. Yeah. You know, you're talking about three meter high security fences. What are they expecting? Somebody coming here in the dark and pinch all the cables? You know. Three meter security for, for things that are metal structures fitted to the ground. I mean, they're, they're not going to be pinching solar panels and running people's houses off them. They're commercial ones, you know. And, and, and I really think that, that that is incongruous to to, to, to the fend and landscape yeah. to, to fence off an adverse effect. eighty whatever it is, however many hectares of land with security fencing. Now we 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 you know we've, we've presented that oh yes we these ought to be approved because it's because it's um, green energy and planning policy supports green energy well let's look at the entire carbon cost of what we're talking about here we're talking about a battery storage unit so are we factoring in the storage of um, or the the the, the strip mining of the, the world for uh, metals uh, you know the children that are working in cobalt mines are we are we factoring in that being transported all around the world to produce the batteries for these things uh probably not uh let alone the the actual structure of the steel work and 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 obviously the loss of the farming then that product whatever was grown there before and one year it might have been taters and another year it might have been wheat or whatever that's all got to be grown somewhere else and if it if we've covered our land with it it won't be here so that will be being imported in from wherever. And we certainly won't be getting much from Ukraine in the next few years in terms of um, mm, cereal growth, growth mm. and so on. So, you know, I can absolutely see where Council of Paris has come from. Um, it's an open landscape. And actually, the Fen landscape should have its own importance and protection. It's bad enough that we have turbines uh, uh, dotted around. And I know there was a very vociferous campaign to stop a huge wind farm, not too far away from this in the Fenland landscape because of its impact. And um, whilst um, I'm happy to support Councillor Parrish's uh, loss of agricultural land, I would add that the, um, that the visual amenity and the disamenity for those people that live in the locality is outweighs the um, benefits, benefits mm -hmm. because the benefits are factored as I believe the carbon benefit that, that's perceived to come from these is minuscule. And if every single house had panels on the roof, as mine does, and as other people's do, there would be no need for mm. these. Um, and certainly battery storage in, lo in remote locations without the ability to be able to uh, um, deal with them if they if there is heaven forbid something go wrong with them is again a very large concern thank, thank you. you i'm just going to get stuart to come back and then i'm going to take council de wally and knock wait yeah, a minute I, stuart's just coming I'd back probably yeah. steer away from some of the detailed comments there about the batteries i mean we've all obviously all got yeah. mobile phones as well but the issues for me are Impact, landscape impact, which Council Long has referred to on the, on, on that mm -hmm. Fenland landscape. And, and secondly, loss of agricultural land, because that's what DM20 actually says. Um, council will seek to resist where there's a significant loss of agricultural oh. land or where the best and most versatile grades of agricultural land are proposed to be used. So that there is that, that, that is obviously what, can, and that's what Council Parry said. Now you've got to set that against the benefits of solar, which is supported in government policies, no doubt about that, and renewables and energy generation. And also in this case, there is some biodiversity enhancements as well to be factored in. So those are the comments that you weigh up against each other, if you like. Obviously, have come down on one side, but obviously members, you'll have to make that assessment and, and which side you want to uh, right. come down on. Councillor Diwali next. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I have to uh, refute uh, Councillor Long's assertion uh, that, uh, in fact, solar panels are one of the lowest, have one of the lowest carbon footprints of any form of power generation. And I'm more than, well, battery storage is, is extremely helpful in um, smoothing out the flows. However, um, what I would like to point out is that we've already 
um, um, approved uh, the, today um, development on grade three agricultural land because the benefits outweigh um, the disadvantages. Now, I'd like to point out to you the international, in, sorry, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change's report published just last month and the need to rapidly decarbonize our society, our civilization. And in this report, they say, uh, climate change has reduced food security and affected water security due to warming, changing precipitation patterns, reduction and loss of cryospheric elements and greater frequency and intensity of climate extremes, thereby hindering efforts to meet sustainable development goals with a high confidence. So if we don't decarbonize, we will actually impact food production dramatically globally. Um, therefore, I do support the officers uh, in this, um, uh, in supporting this application. However, um, I do note that a neighbor has um, spoken of concern about noise attenuation, and that hasn't been addressed. So I would ask for that to be addressed, please. Anna? Uh, well, I think it's clear from the report that there's no objection from CSNM with regard to um, any potential noise disturbance arising from the development when it's operational, as well as during the construction period and safeguarding conditions um, have been imposed to that effect. Thank you, Chairman. Can I ask, has any consideration been taken into place the fact that where this is being built is out in the countryside where there is certain stillness compared to in town? For the noise is vastly different living in a countryside than it is in the town and noise travels in the countryside compared to what's in town yeah background noise levels would be determined as part of any um, application and noise assessment submitted thank you chairman right councillor knockholds thank you the fens have got have got the reputation all throughout england for growing food we can't keep eating French beans from abroad and broccoli from Europe. We have to grow more and more of our food. Um, the correspondence mentions about different grading of land. I can't see in our report, I may have missed it, what grade this particular oh, land is. Three. Yes, in there. So two and three. Therefore, I believe this land should be left for growing our food so that we can eat more of them for... Personally, I'd rather have more food than, than more heating. We can't live without food, so we have to keep growing our own, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Story. Yeah. Yes, Madam Chairman. Um, I'd just like to pick up that point. I think I'm right in saying, as regards this business about growing food, um, our own food in our own country to a certain degree, and taking land out of production for solar panel farms. I think the fact is, Madam Chairman, from now on until 2027, the subsidy farmers get for growing food has disappeared. That's gone on to the environment. Environmental land management scheme is where it's gone to. So we're already in the process of taking probably more land out of production because of the subsidy which farmers will get for um, putting into other schemes. So as regards food production, one would assume we're on an Emma Randall spiral. Um, I'm all, as I would be, I suppose, being a farmer, through growing, growing the food for people in this country so we can live off our own production, as it were, to a certain extent. So when I look at applications like this, of course I can see the benefits if we need renewable energy. Of course, that's what's required. We all know that. But we have to weigh up, as Councillor Tuckall said, are we actually going to eat our own food? Or, as Councillor Long said, and others, import it from other countries because we probably won't have enough. So that is a very dilemma I find myself in being a farmer, Madam Chairman, to a certain extent. We've only seen probably this last three or four months the uproar there seems to have been for a few empty shelves and a supermarket. Well, those empty shelves, may I say, Madam Chair, I hope I'm not diversifying too much. I'm listening. I don't know what, what, what exact the products were, but one would assume there's an extreme amount of choice out there 
for people to eat. Well, half that choice, or whatever the percentage is, is probably out of season. Do the food out of season taste as good as that was in season? Probably not. Have we got too much choice of food? Probably yes. With the greatest respect, Madam Chairman, the balance has to be produced, and I'm all for cheaper energy, to be fair. But I must say, Chairman, and everyone here, fortunately, we're all speaking on full stomachs, and that comes through food. So therefore, Madam Chairman, I have to age, not just being a farmer, I have to look at this in planning terms, and being a member of this committee, I have to look at this, but the size of the area which is proposed is just too large for where it is as far as I'm concerned, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Rives. And the mic, please. I absolutely agree with everything, everything Councillor Story has said. I'd just like to raise two additional points which haven't really been considered as far as I can see. First of all, there's been no uh, question raised in this presentation or indeed any discussion I've heard on solar panelling about the cost of decommissioning. I don't know. I would like to think that in every single proposal we, we get in the future, that uh, applicants will make sure that they inform us of the decommissioning yeah. costs, which I understand are around about two and a half thousand dollars uh, <coughs> an acre. So in this particular case, this was entire decommissioning costs of one yeah, two million. Yeah, there is decommissioning condition on twenty three. You know. Right, but what, what I was trying to say was that the actual cost of decommissioning this, this asset will be around about $1.2 million based on its yeah. size. And we should all be aware of that, I think, is the point. Well, that the is second... not a planning consideration, the cost. Huh? It is not a planning consideration, the cost of the decommissioning. It is a consideration. Is our I would think the planning needs to be certain that money is available for the decommissioning. It be we are talking 30-odd years hence. It might have varied. It's going to exist. Second point, the, the, the applicant makes a uh, great hay of the fact that at the moment this land is being used for sort of uh, non-food production. That's just a red herring. You know, if it comes out of production, then presumably the non-food production of, of, of uh, fuel stocks is going to have to be put somewhere else. So I don't accept the argument that uh, somehow that because this land is only being used to kind of grow non-food, somehow it's, 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 it's more uh, acceptable to take it out of production. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holmes. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I've got uh, a cutting from your local paper dated 21st of April 2023, and it's about our local port, King's Lynn. Because of its, I'm, I'm quoting here, because of its extensive arable hinterland, Lynn has been expecting exporting wheat to feed European cities for centuries. Barley exports from our wash port remain significant. Four vessels carried cargoes to, to, to the Netherlands, Spain, and Belgium, and Cork. We also export malted barley to Scotland for the dis distilleries. That's, that's an interesting food we should all be partaking in. And um, a vessel sailed to Santander in northern Spain with a cargo of rye which has not been exported from Lynn for many years. Does that suggest that we're going to miss a small amount of land? Uh, I doubt very much whether these two plots would fill any ship with a cargo of grain. So we're not really in that, in that area. We're exporting millions of tons of ag agricultural products to Europe and elsewhere. To Spain, a lot of it goes for animal feed. She's not feeding human beings in that sense. So I think the, the, the argument about um, removing land from agricultural use is completely irrelevant. It's still land which is producing oxygen from the grass. And it does it all year round. My field opposite where I live, which is an arable field, but at least I would say two thirds of the year actually doesn't produce anything because it's been ploughed out. I think the argument here is more to do with whether we can use some of this land for better purposes than exporting wheat to yeah. the continent and elsewhere. And one other point I should remind us that Councillor Kirk 
has farmed on this area for many years, doesn't farm there anymore, but he explains in quite, de quite detail that this land is not really suitable for the type of arable uh, foods that, that are being uh, suggested around this table. Thank you. Councillor Lawson. Uh, and the, the last time we, this came on. Could you come nearer your mic, please, rather than sit there relaxed? The, the last time this came up, Councillor Story did tell us that it doesn't matter what grade of land it is, you can still grow crops on it. So this excuse of it being poor grade land is rubbish. Right, Stuart. I understand that point, but we've got to look at government policy and our local policy and that, about that, what's, what that says on the best and most valuable land. So that's what we're looking at, the planning policies. So that, that's where yeah. we're, we're coming from. I mean, across the story is no doubt right. Yeah. Uh, but BM20, our own policy, talks about best and most versatile, as do Natural England in their, their, their comment on this application. So we've just got to bear that in mind. Right. Well, anyway, on the table, I've got refused by Councillor Parish, seconded by Councillor Long. Um, sorry? Sorry. Oh, what are you going to come with now? I've got a new point. You never know. Must be new point. Oh, you say. That's the story. These pearls are coming. <laughs> just, to, just to say, I think, Madam Chairman, just to back up the, the situation about poorer land and, and not food, food food production, that sort of thing, I think on Saturday's EGP suggested that Savills, as you know, the land agents, suggested grade three plus land has gone up 27% in value. And that's because people have gone wide range of crops on it, which can be irrigated, so therefore that's food production. So anyway, uh, Councillor Holmes is probably right in his um, opinion of reading the local press. And what I would say to him is, if there's a drought, which climate change seems to just say, well, maybe, you won't be exporting too much, Councillor Holmes, you'll be importing it. We've seen that in the past. So I do ask, to, and also, Mr Councillor Holmes, if you don't mind me saying, the fact is that food subsidies, as I've just told you, are coming off food production and they're going towards the environment. So you'll probably get less grown in this country. No. no. Councillor Parrish, I'm we've had enough debate now. We've thrashed this out. Councillor Parrish, are you still happy to propose refusal? Yes, Thank you. So I have a proposal by you, seconded by Councillor Long. And if you want to read it. And the planning reasons were that it was contrary to DM20 and also the uh, loss of agricultural land and as I got the, the, the debate, the chair, the debate I've got is two reasons, both related to DM20, in that the uh, loss yeah, of yeah, well, the best and most versatile grades of agricultural land, there was a significant loss uh, of that in this application uh, by virtue of, of, of that. Uh, and also the landscape impact on the uh, effectively the Fenland yeah. uh, landscape, both um, outweigh the benefits of the proposal, contrary to the M20. So we're voting for refusal. Uh, Wendy? Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bauer? Four. Councillor Bubb? Four. Councillor Holmes? Against. Councillor Howland? Four. Councillor Hudson? Councillor Hudson? Um, Councillor Lawton? Four. Councillor Manning? Four. Councillor Knuckles? Four. Councillor Parrish? Four. Councillor Mrs. Spikins? Four. Councillor Storey? Four. Councillor Tyler? Four. Councillor Diwali? Against. Councillor Whitby? Four. Councillor Long? Four. Councillor Rose? Four. And Councillor Rives? Four. That's carried, Chairman. Therefore, that Thank refusal you. is carried. Now, members, I make it one o'clock. I'm going to stop for lunch, and if we can have you back for one thirty, please. Thank you for a comfort break.
sort of. <laughs> Everybody here is, uh, aren't we? Yes. So I'm going to, are we all right to start, okay. Wendy? Yeah. Thank you. Right, members. I'm going to start with page 120, Wigan Hall St. Germans. I have two speakers and there's late correspondence, please, member. It's for the installation of a battery energy storage system at Wigan Hall. It's a full application. The recommendation here is approved. And that's to you, Keith, please. Oh, technical hitch. Oh, dear. Oh. Any luck? Thank you very much for the start again. Um, sorry about the technical hitch. The site in question, uh, most members hope will be familiar with, it's south of the uh, the power station, um, just around the corner from the police holding facility, the, the roundabout, you know it, and the uh, the tip. Um, so it's high road on the way down towards Wiganall St Germans. So it's on the western side of the road between the, the Use Relief Channel. Uh, to the north of the site, we have the power station, which is just off the uh, the screen. And uh, we've got, um, what's it called? A pressure reduced, meet, reducing metering station which is in association with Palm Paper. So it's one of the uh, bits of kit which uh, serves them. Uh, we've got the um, national grid uh, to the north of it. This is what's uh, proposed in terms of the plan format. Uh, it's for a battery energy storage system facility or BESS as they're commonly referred to. Um, so the site in question is south of the pressure facility as it sits in here like so. So it's quite a substantial site in terms of the, the overall site area, but however, the, the only um, bit that's uh, actually covered by the, the kit is about 3,600 square metres. So it's not particularly uh, huge. There's a new access proposed off high road just beyond the, uh, the corner there. And we've got a um, new farmhouse to the south and two properties to cottages one and two high road to the east of the site. These are um, illustrations of the, the sort of um, infrastructure which we're looking towards introducing on the particular site. As you can see, there are uh, these, these sort of um, elements which are on skids which are raised 0.6 uh, uh, above ground level. Uh, there is a two metre high bond, earth bond, which uh, surrounds the site. And within that, there is a three and a half metre high acoustic fence and security measures as well. So this is a section through the site, which shows the bonds on the outside, security fencing in, in the, um, to the rear of it. And this is a section through the site, east west. So the majority of the site will be just peeping over the uh, the two metre high bonding. Uh, that will be landscaped as well, but I'll show you that in context in a second. So the larger pieces of kit um, raised to uh, between six and a half and seven and a half metres, I recall. Um, but there towards the northern end of the site, which are adjacent to the, uh, the pressure reducing facility next door. Right, uh, a lot of, this is the master plan for the landscaping scheme, which you can see there's a lot of planting on the, uh, the, the buffer, the peripheral areas in terms of the, the bonding around the site to the south and to the west and, and north as well. And around the focal point where the access is and those parallel planting along the road frontage to give incident screening from the most uh, public areas. This is the site um, seen without any landscaping involved. So this is the, um, the, the one we're referring to primarily. 
um, is the eastern elevation, which is on the next screen. So it's a long, the scale unfortunately is broken up into two. So that's the southern section and that's the northern section. As you can see, the gated access point there and the more complex kit, which is at the northern end adjacent to the uh, reducing facility. This is the landscaping scheme uh, from five years uh, hence uh, upon commencement to the uh, the planting. As you can see, the uh, the buffer would be created around the, the site. Uh, that's the most prominent uh, elevation to the east. And then after a further period when it's fully, fully established, which um, shows the effectiveness of the screening around the uh, the facility itself. This is the typical access track, which is taken from the, the road across the, the current agricultural land to the site itself, uh, deer fencing or security fencing and palisade and acoustic. And these are just examples to, to illustrate uh, the, the type of um, fencing proposed. And an example of a, an existing development as you can see this is the, the, the type of um, equipment which is proposed within the site itself now looking from the high road we will try to give you a, a context uh, shots as you can see there's quite a few um, aerial uh, overhead um, cable work as well and pylons plus there's also um, lots of underground um, gas facilities as well which uh, is not uncommon in these um, sort of facilities and close to power stations and connections. So we're looking southwest across the uh, the site. So this is the development will be in, in here roughly. And depending further around, and we can see there the pressure reducing metering station, which is not dissimilar to what we're uh, we're proposing to the, the south of it. So we go from there further southwards so it uh, virtually connect. We're now standing on the public footpath which runs to the north of the site looking down towards uh, numbers one and two high road you can see there a new farmhouse is set within that heavily landscaped um, surround and people might know it were a, a battery uh, sorry a tire uh, sales place as well so you might be familiar with that. Uh, this little bit closer, uh, it's closer to the, the facility, so it, it sits in here. You'll see that there's a, a 33 kilovolt uh, overhead cable to go across here. This looks to be um, made to go underground, so there'll be two poles either end of the, the site to, to drop it into the ground and divert it around the, um, the actual complex. So there'll be a, a bonus in terms of losing that, in terms of visual impact. And uh, that's just a view of the, the metering station from the, uh, the footpath as well. And that's the connection which would go into the substation, which is uh, sitting to the north of the site. This just shows the um, traffic management um, scheme to uh, show the routes in and out when uh, delivering the construction vehicles and things. So that shows the, the blue lines coming in sorry, the red line's going in and blue line's going out. So uh, that demonstrates the uh, the routes into the site and out of the site, depending on which um, area the, the actual uh, deliveries are coming from. So that has been thought about and is part of the package. The uh, key issues are, are outlined on page 121 and the Planning applications recommended for approval subject to certain conditions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you. Could I have Nicola Thornton, please? Thank you, Chair Chairperson. Good afternoon, members. Never the application that. before you today is a sustainable de development that will support the transition of the UK's energy supply to a low carbon energy network in accordance with the Council's own climate change strategy and action plan. Battery and other forms of energy storage have been specifically identified by the government, along with various bodies, including National Grid, as a key part of the strategy for decarbonising the energy network and achieving the UK's net zero commitments. 
Both the MPPF and the development plan support renewable energy and low carbon development in principle, subject to ensuring that the impacts of development are or can be made acceptable. Accordingly, the site has been selected and the proposals developed to ensure that the impacts of the scheme with mitigation, when necessary, are acceptable. The proposed best will be situated approximately 50 metres to, to the south of the existing Kings Lynn grid substation. UK Power Networks has confirmed that there is capacity for import and export of electricity from and to the grid, and accordingly a grid connection offer has been secured from UK Power Networks. The best is within the context of existing commercial and electricity infrastructure. The site abuts a gas pressure reducing metering system associated with palm paper. Adjacent to the site, the northeast is Saddleborough, Saddleborough Industrial Estate. The site has suitable access without modification to the existing highway network. The land tape will be relatively small in terms of renewable energy projects and only 0.6 hectares will be covered by the BESS compound and the bond. The permission is for 40 years and the land will be reinstated at the end of that time. Whilst concerns regarding fire risk are understandable, only one of the 161 operational energy storage sites in the UK has been subject to a fire incident. The site of that fire used a different, less stable type of lithium ion battery to those now proposed here. However, fire risk, fire reducing risk is a top priority for the industry and for Cambridge Power in order to ensure the continued safe operation of our assets. We take on board analysis and lessons learned from the fire authority. In line with the latest industry best practice, a range of measures are, incorporate, are incorporated to prevent and mitigate the risk of fire, which includes gas detection as part of a fire detection detection system, which will detect and shut down the battery system at an early stage. Inbuilt fire suppression systems to extinguish fires at the outset before they develop. And remote monitoring that will be in place 24 seven, provided by a national provider with a central control room. Subject to planning conditions that CPL agree with, Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service has raised no object objection to the proposed development. I can confirm Cambridge Power's commitment to continue working with the fire service to develop a suitable energy emergency response plan, which will be secured by a planning condition. Flood defences are in place in the locality. In the unlikely event of flood, circuit breakers will activate, which will isolate the BESS. This will prevent damage to the wider infrastructure network. Noise has been considered and addressed by the careful placement of acoustic fencing to ensure the development does not give rise to amenity issues. In addition to the significant benefits of supporting the transition to low carbon energy network and near -net, near net zero objectives, the scheme includes a significant new, land, significant new landscaping that will develop, develop, deliver an overall net gain of 117% in habitat units and 97.5% in hedgerow units. There are no statutory consulty objections to the proposed sustainable development. The proposals comply with relevant development plan policies and the MPPF. There are no adverse impacts or other material planning considerations that would outweigh the benefits. We therefore respectfully request that members approve the application. Um, I just want to just say something a little bit further. Um, Cambridge Power are obviously aware of the, um, the fire incident in Liverpool. And we have looked at the um, fire services response in relation to that fire and what we would do differently. Um, and I just want to just briefly just go through that because I think I've got You've a few got more minutes. You've got 19 left. seconds. 19. Yep. Okay. We'll engage with the emergency services during the design and build. Um, we, under we will undertake regular joint emergency response exercises, both tabletop and real attendance. We'll engage with the emergency service. Uh, we'll ensure they're un they understand the electrical hazards and have access to contact numbers. And that's Thank my time. Much. Thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Right, Thank Councillor you. Kemp. Thank you. Well, I'm asking you to refuse this application because it's much too close to the town and it does represent a fire risk. 
Lithium ion batteries are sensitive to temperatures, are highly flammable, even phosphorus, which is what the applicant has said it's going to use. In fact, there was a, um, a fatal two fatalities in an explosion with a facility of this kind in China last year. Two firefighters were, were sadly killed. Now, um, the applicant has said that it still hasn't produced an evacuation plan or anything like that. The fire service wrote to me and said that in the event of it catching fire, they first of all prioritize life, life of firefighters, and then they would think about letting it burn. They could let it burn or extinguish it. Now, if it's extinguished, these facilities can then reignite, they can burn for weeks, and letting it burn would have a huge implication to the surrounding population. There's the residential site close by, the traveller site, an area of great deprivation, they've not been considered. And then there's South Lynn, which is just the other side of the A47. Then there's the rest of the town. Noxious fumes are given up if, if these do catch fire. And they're certainly not environmentally friendly because they can then pollute the water supply and put out such chemicals, cobalt, nickel, manganese. Um, it's amazing that the applicant, is, they told me that it was going to be manned 24 seven, but not, um, but virtually um, from um, miles and miles away in Bury St Edmunds. And um, in, the, in Liverpool, when it caught fire, the facility burnt for several hours before any, every, anybody knew what was happening. Um, I don't think therefore that they've put fire safety at the top of the tree here. Um, an investigation into why the facility caught fire in um, in China was related to um, dust and sand. It's a very dusty area, um, this, this side near the willows. And we're also aware that we now have very high temperatures in the summer and heat sensitivity to a facility out in the open air is something that hasn't been fully thought through. This is also in the open countryside. It takes away agricultural facilities. It's the high risk flood zone. So it's against policy because it's outside the, the development zone. But looking at the, the whole issue about thermal runaway, um, this is a facility which would be there for 40 years. We already know we have um, fire risk. For example, it took 100 firefighters to put out a fire mm -hmm. some years ago at Palm Paper. We've had the risk of illegal waste sites, which we've had to do a lot of enforcement around. And we don't need another risk here. Um, just um, down upwind of where all the all the, the urban areas live, which presumably um, Southland is right, should be right at the top of this, because it's um, it's an urban area of, of deprivation, and we know that air pollution um, is a determinant of very poor health. These risks have not been thought. The National Gas um, Organization have, have said that the um, there needed to be various tests to see if it was going to be suitable. I mean, it goes across pipeline four of the national grid, and there have not been the DC tests or the earth resistivity tests. So it may well be the site's not um, suitable from their point of view either. Um, there are so many unanswered questions here, but the fact is that chemical fires are the worst fires of all, and they shouldn't be put next to major, major towns like Kings Lynn. Um, it's completely the wrong site. It's not the right technology. We need we need to reduce we need to reduce what we're doing as to risk. And the idea of the the fire service actually even saying that there's an option of letting it burn. We don't know who would have to be evacuated. What the risks long term, short term, medium term would be the population. This this must be refused. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Joyce. Please now on Zoom. Uh, thank you, Madam Jim, for allowing me to address the committee. Many years were spent developing a local plan. For the past four years, some members of the committee have actually been engaged on reviewing the local plan. At no time did anyone suggest development of any kind on this site. In late November, in dismissing an appeal in West Norfolk, the inspector recognised this permission, whereas where it was acknowledged policy CS1 and CS2 set the overarching approach to the location of new development. Commenting on CS6, the inspector made it clear the wording of CS6, I'll get that right sometime, gave the direction of the local plan where it states, and I quote, in the countryside, the strategy will be to protect the countryside for its intrinsic character and beauty the diversity of its landscapes, heritage and wildlife, and its natural resources to be enjoyed by all. The development of green sites, greenfield sites, will be resisted unless essential for agricultural and forestry needs, 
I do repeat, the development of greenfield sites will be resisted unless essential for agricultural or forestry needs. There is neither agricultural nor forestry needs associated with this development. In fact, the opposite is true. The inspector went further, commenting on policies, CS6 and CS8 in the core strategy, regarding development in the countryside. Again, I quote the inspector, it requires development to enhance the quality of the area. The applicant makes no claim this development will enhance the quality of the area, but the requirement made by the inspector for a development to be considered as acceptable in the countryside is that the development will enhance the quality of the area. The report suggests that the application abides by DM20, which does relate to renewable energy. Uh, Madam Chairman, while I recognize the argument of which is more important, the security of energy supply or food supply, DM20 is clear, as the Assistant Director has previously stated, where it states, again I quote, the Borough Council will seek to resist proposals where A, there is a significant loss of agricultural land, or B, where the land in the best and most versatile grades of agricultural land are proposed to be used. Madam Chairman and Committee, case law suggests the policies quoted in the report to support this application, in fact, object to this application. Your committee and all members of the committee should refuse this application on the grounds it is not compliant with case law, nor CS1, CS2, CS6, CS8, DM2, and DM20. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chairman, and thank you all the committee for allowing me to speak. Thank you for coming, Councillor Joyce. Not a problem. Right. Um, anything to add? Just to say, I mean, page one, three, the conclusion, really, and there is a planning balance to be applied. You can approve it. Uh, it's a decision, as it was the last time, to take to weigh the, the benefits of the proposal uh, against obviously the, the, the harm. Um, our view is, as has been said, it's two hectares, I think, significantly different than the last of our scheme, and vastly different. Uh, my view is obviously it's not, in terms of location, it's located next to existing infrastructure, um, which is there already. And in terms of consultees, you'll see, especially on bottom of page 124 and 125, the list of well, Norfolk Fire and Rescue Service, Caden Gas, Health and Safety Exec, National Gas Transmission, UK Power Networks, none of them have any objection uh, to the scheme. Good morning, Chairman. Right. Could I have some clarification then, please? I noticed that there's a farmhouse um, being proposed. Is that right? Or is it just on there? Uh, that, that's the name of the dwelling, Madam Chairman. Sorry? That's the name of the dwelling, new that's, farmhouse. Yeah, right. It's not a proposal for a new Yeah, farm. that's right. So just want a clarifi clarification. Right, members, who wishes to take this up? Councillor Long? Yeah, um, as you'll see from the report, uh, uh, Madam Chairman, I um, requested that this be considered by the committee, and I didn't make any reference to whether I did or didn't support the application. It actually lies within mine and Councillor Barriers' ward, not in the ward of Councillor Kemp or Councillor Joyce. But on this occasion, I do welcome the input from Councillor Joyce, especially who's looked at planning policy and not just potential fire risk as to reasons why he feels this um, application is not acceptable. Um, I'll be listening very carefully to what others have to say, but I must admit my, you know, when you look at this site, it's adjacent to a power station. So the logic is you, generate power within the power station. And when there's not a requirement for it, you've got somewhere to store it and let it out. Somewhat different to create in a power station as we saw in the last application, um, you know, the power station is already there. Um, that being said, I agree with Councillor Joyce, this is agricultural land um, and is, you know, continuing sort of developed sprawl out from the power station you know, that there's already a fair blot on the landscape, but everyone would probably say that we do need, you know, power to power things. Incidentally, on the same industrial state, there was a proposal, as Councillor Kemp will be well aware, for a waste incinerator. Um, now that land is 
in the in uh, industrial site, and it is with um, a very close proximity. It has it, it suffers from exactly the same flood risk, and that was a case I think that we made as a district mm -hmm. council against that proposal about the uh, potential flood risk. Just just you know just the other side of the power station, if you like, from where that was proposed. You know the flood risk is going to be very similar. Um, would I rather see um, a waste incinerator that's burning, filled filled with water, and put out? Yes, I would. <laughs> would I rather? Would I like to see lithium ion batteries or whatever they are filled with water? Yes, I can see kind of where Councillor Kemp comes from in terms of the risk factor. Mm -hmm. So I'll be listening carefully as as ward councillor. I represent the people that are physically the nearest to this. And, our, and the next nearest people are, are, are the folks that Councillor Kemp mentioned. Um, but uh, I think the sort of carte blanche that this ought to be approved because it's considered green is another uh, misnomer because the actual mining of all the materials to produce those batteries will probably the 40 year payback, you might start to see a payback you know, on, on the sort of carbon footprint of mining it, transporting it and producing it. But um, I'll be interested to hear what others think. Right, Councillor Diwali, then I've got Holmes. Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as you know, I'm, I am for um, renewables. Uh, however, I do have my concerns with this site. Um, uh, the lithium, lithium iron phosphate uh, batteries are still subject to thermal run away. Uh, they, uh, if they're in an overcharge um, condition and they reach 120 degrees or thereabouts, they can um, catch fire. And uh, if the monitoring, adequate monitoring is not in place, and from what I understand from the early stages of um, overcharge, the temperature doesn't rise uh, particularly quickly. Um, so it's quite difficult to monitor. This isn't an emerging technology. Um, and I do have concerns that it is in proximity to a um, uh, to a significant population centre, and it is in very close proximity to gas infrastructure. Um, the Norfolk Fire Service is not equipped to put out a fire of this scale if it were to take place, and I think these are important considerations. Thank you. Thank you. Could I have Councillor Holmes next, please? Then Parish. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, Despite my pleas on the previous application, I'm going to be speaking against this application. I think um, we've heard at length about fire risk and how it can be mitigated or not, as the case may be. Mine is similar to that, but let's face it, it's on the edge of a river. A river which is prone to flooding from time to time. And this is technology which has issues. They say a one in 200 year flood risk. Well, if you think about the last major flood in the area, that was 1953, 70 years from then. So we're talking about one in 130 risk. Over 40 years, it's a one in three risk. That sounds like mm. a pretty high risk to me. Now, I may be wrong, I'm not a statistician, I'm just looking at these numbers, but I'm thinking, do we really need this type of risk on the edge of a major town, on the edge of a sluice? There is some sluices just up the road from there. Um, and if this goes bang, what would be the effect on those? Thank you. Um, yes, you wish to come back? Can I, yes, uh, Madam Chairman, I can. In terms of the flood risk mitigation issues, if there is a flood, then the proposal is to elevate the units by 600 mil, uh, 600 centimetres. So they're going to be elevated out uh, above any flood risk um, uh, level. And that's been sanctioned by the Environment Agency. Thank you. Right, Councillor Parrish. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't want to add much. I'd, I'd like to agree with them. Um, Comments made by my new buddy, Councillor Long, over there. Um, there, are, there are obviously um, issues about fire risk. Um, I'm thinking back to my days as uh, doing chemistry and so on. And um, lithium is uh, 
a very inflammable substance and uh, associating it with water is not the best thing to do. Um, having said which, the argument that uh, this isn't like the last application is, is true to an effect that, that although it's great to farmland, it's 0.6 hectares as opposed to 33 hectares. So it is a, a much smaller amount. Um, so I'd hesitate to object on, on that grounds. Um, but as has been alluded to, the people who think that um, energy storage and, and so on is, is all green um, technology is uh, completely wrong. I do know that uh, creating the battery for a, an electric car creates far, far more CO2 than building a standard car. Um, well, we're not talking about building cars here, but we are talking about uh, building very large batteries. So I imagine the carbon footprint of those batteries is huge and would take time to uh, recover. Um, and it's also the fact that mining most lithium in the world is pretty obnoxious, um, involving desecrating vast tra uh, tracts of countryside or nature, but also more, more importantly, I think, um, not being very good for the lives of the people who are actually miners. Um, there are plans to mine some in Cornwall, and one assumes they won't use forced labour in Cornwall, but you never know. Um, but that is is not with us at the moment. So lithium for these batteries and for many more to come will come from these uh, unfortunate areas and have to put up with the, the mining. So I'm sitting on the fence a little while people um, continue to talk about this, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Anything to add? At all? No, uh, no, I'm no chemist or um, physician, uh, as you, you probably gather, being a planner. Um, nevertheless, we have to sort of uh, take on board all the, the sort of information that's, that's put forward. Um, and I, I think in terms of the, the battery facilities and, and think that we're, we're all guilty of that, um, like lawnmowers uh, powered by that, that sort of source uh, and a lot of other bits of equipment I've got in the household. Um, and even with the, the solar panels, it was alluded to uh, earlier that the solar panels on roofs were the, the way forward. But there is also the facility within households to have battery storage because that's that's inherent with it. So once again, battery storage and these sort of facilities are, are with us on a, a, a daily basis. And, and we're living with that presently. Thank you, Councillor Bob. Thank you. Yes, this technology is far too new, I think, to put in a vulnerable position. We do not know what these things are going to do in 25 years' time because they haven't been around long enough to test. However, should we vote in favour of this proposal, I'd like to draw attention to the fact that they are acknowledging that it could flood, so they are raising the buildings, etc. But the all-important screening, which we are conditioning, is there, is only guaranteed or required to be looked after for five years. Six years' time, the seawater comes over. It's going to kill the screening. So I would like to see the requirement for the screening to extend for the life of the, 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 uh, the proposal if it is flooded, because otherwise all the screening is just going to die um, and you're just going to be able to see it. Uh, we want the screening. It's a great idea. But if it's good, if there's no requirement to, to put it back if it's killed, um, it's rather pointless. Right. So you're asking for a screening for the lifetime of this project. Do you have a um, seconder for this, Councillor Long? Our members, are we? Is it all right to put that in? Can I just come back on that point? If there is a flood, the the estimated uh, flood height or the depth will be 0.6 of a metre. Um, the actual bunding is two metres, so it's, it's well above that level. So it's only the, the foot of the or the base of that, that sort of uh, area which would be touched if there was a flood. Um, so the, the landscaping above it will be retained. So I'll go back to you. Having heard that information, do you wish to retract it? If we it? put it in and it's so unlikely to be used, it's not going to cause a problem for anybody. If someone's got it wrong, then we've got it covered. Well, Stuart. If that's what members um, you know, would right. request. Right. I'm going to then put it to the vote with what you proposed, seconded by Councillor Long. Are you happy, members, to have a screening put in for the lifetime of this project? And please, those in favour. Um, that's agreed. That goes on to that recommendation. Then I've got Councillor Rives. Have you got a new point, please, Councillor Rives? Really a question. Um, 
On the face of it, it seems logical to put a battery pack next to the power station. What would be the loss of efficiency if the batteries were moved from the power station? Has anyone got an estimate of that? I'm given to believe it's a bit like an uh, analogy with a, a hose pipe. The further away you get from the source, then the, the quality is uh, diminished. Right. But uh, supposing it was a mile away, what sort of do we have any ideas as to what loss of efficiency there might be? Okay. Um, excuse me. We're debating what's in front here. Well, yes. It's speculative. It, my, my answer is be, one if, thing. if you're considering this, one of the aspects is how efficient is it going to be in this location? Does it need to be in this location? Or could it be almost as efficient if it was, let's say, five miles away and didn't threaten the water supply, wasn't next to a sort of a, a, a gas facility and wasn't on the borders of King's Lynn? So that, that's my question. Uh, my guess would be no. I, I think it wouldn't be as efficient because... Um, the, right, but the, I, I the think, do we, are we able to quantify the reduction in efficiency? No, I'm not in a position to do that. I'm no expert on that, I'm afraid. I think in the absence of that information, it, I, I wouldn't wish to proceed with this. Well, that's your that's your prerogative, if you so wish. Is there anything else to add? Right, then in which case I've got a recommendation for approving, including that condition of screening to be for a lifetime of this project. Wendy, could you take the vote, please, for approve? Thank you, Chairman. This is for approval, members. Councillor Bauer? For. Councillor Bubb? Against. Councillor Holmes? Against. Councillor Howland? For. Councillor Hudson? Against. Councillor Lawton? Against. Councillor Manning? Against. Councillor Knuckles? For. Councillor Parrish? Against. Councillor, uh, Mrs. Vikings. Four. Councillor Story. Yes. Councillor Tyler. Four. Councillor Diwali. Against. Councillor Whitby. Four. Councillor Long. Against. Councillor Rose. Yes. And Councillor Rives. Right, then in which case... Um, debate, you've got to come up with refusal. Yes, I need you to come up with a debate as to your reasons for refusal. I'll refer you to the YouTube footage, and I think Councillor Joyce made some very relevant points. So you're talking oh. about C1, C2, C2, 6 and 8, DM2 and DM20. Well, of course I did. That's what my job is. Okay, what, what aspects of those and what are the reasons I've got to ask? So, what aspects? So, so you're saying development in the countryside. Can I take one at a time, please? Could I have your hand up as for planning reasons why you've turned around and recommended refuse? All those who said it. Right. Did you abstain? Oh, you went against. Right. Can I have the planning reasons, please? Okay. So, you, so you're saying development in the countryside, uh, effectively. That's that's one. Yeah. Right, affecting the character of the countryside. I mean, again, this is this is for you to come up with it. Yeah, and it's not for it's him not for to come up, uh, Stuart, beg your pardon, to come up with your planning reasons why you refuse. You're going to be put on your toes. You've gone and asked for refusal. Come up with it. Councillor Hudson. Um, possibility of these breakfasts catching fire. Gas. It's covered by separate legislation. Yes, oh. that's still not a planning reason. I need planning reasons. Otherwise, I'm in trouble here with you. <laughs> You've said it. We have, we have got impact on the development, obviously, development country, countryside policies, which is CSO6. You've got a proposal, Council Lawton? No, I'm sorry. That doesn't come well, in. If we, if we stick to the planning reasons, the planning it, reasons. What, what you said is obviously CS6, you meant DM20 was mentioned. So what you're saying effectively DM2 is DM2 and DM20. It's the surrounding, the landscape impact, uh, again, relating to. Uh, development in the countryside. Councillor yeah, so Long, pearls of wisdom here. I'm very, con <laughs> very concerned about the um, impact on amenity of those that are nearest to, especially those with, I believe, protected characteristics. Okay, but in terms of what as what aspect um, of that is it noise? If there's no noise from them. Is it what, what in what aspect is their amenity? 
Where is um, their my, my own view is I would stick to the, you know, rather come up with reasons if you like. CSO 6 and DM20 have been talked about. Yes. It is in the countryside. I think DM20 um, is their best I, way forward. Those are the um, two. And I shouldn't be doing it. I didn't vote for it. <laughs> mm. Councillor Parrish. Yeah, I'm just DM20, and if you look at page 128, I've got DM20 down, lots of bullet points. Um, so you could argue that it's uh, impact on the surrounding landscape and townscape. It's in impact on um, amenity, um, impact on water courses, impact on public safety. So you can say that it, we're concerned about all those things in DM20. Right. Okay. So that we don't no, that's up to you. That, that's fine. Right, members, we are now going to vote on that recommendation for refusal. So this is validated as it's part of the process, which I have to do. You have come up with the planning reasons for refusal for do it DM. 20. Yeah, I'll read that out. It's the impact of development in the, development in the countryside, harm in the intrinsic value, see landscaping, townscape. I've also mentioned in terms of DM20, potential impacts on water courses and um, public safety, which you feel outweigh the benefits um, of the scheme. Right. So we're now going to take the vote on that. All right, members, you're all happy with what Stuart said as the reasons for refusal. When? Uh, thank you, go. Chairman. Councillor Bauer. Against. Councillor Bubb? Four. Councillor Holmes? Four. Councillor Howland? Four. Councillor Hudson? Four. Councillor Lawton? Four. Councillor Manning? Four. Councillor Knuckles? Against. Councillor Parrish? Four. Councillor Mrs. Spikings? Against. Councillor Storey? Four. Councillor Tyler? Against. Councillor Diwali. Four. Councillor Whitby. Against. Councillor Long. Four. Councillor Rose. Four. And Councillor Rives. And then for that's refused, members, thank you. We now move on to the next one, which is... Oh, no, wait a minute. What page is the next one to do? Ah, here it is. Page 143 in Golders Thought. There's late correspondence and a speaker. And it's for the construction of dwelling on plot 12. The recommendation is approved. Who's doing that? Is that you, Hannah? No, that's Olivia. Olivia. Hello, Olivia. Thank you. So this is charge persons ready. Okay, this is a uh, full application which seeks permission for a new dwelling on plot twelve. The residential development as a whole on this site was allowed via appeal with develop um, with all dwellings consistent of self build with an approved design code. Um, therefore, the principle of development on the site has already been established. So this slide shows you what was originally approved under the um, original application for plot 12, again, in line with the design code. If I go to the next one, this... I haven't a clue. Might just be observing. Hey, spy. Carry on. So this was the original approved. Um, sorry, the original plan that came in with the current application. As you can see, it is fairly similar to what was originally approved. However, we've got the addition of a ground floor extension, which is, which essentially infills the floor a plan of the original approval, uh, with also the addition of a terrace area. So these plans included an external staircase. And in line with the parish council comments, we also had concerns about potential overlooking as a result of those. 
So following discussions, amended plan was provided, and this is the application, um, sorry, this is the drawing that we're considering today. So the external staircase has been removed and it, the, the terrace area is still there. However, if approval is granted, we would be conditioning for a screen to be erected and um, details of that provided as well. Other examples of terraces and balconies have been approved within the site as well, following additional applications after the original approval. I will go to some of the photos of the site. So this is the view of the neighbouring property, and you can see the corner of my site here. Uh, this photo, you can again see that neighbouring property to the east of the site and views looking north of the site, so the dwelling would be positioned here. That's views of Ling, Ling Road, which runs adjacent to the site. And again, photos taken from the, this side of Ling Road looking back. So you can see the neighbouring property, plot 12 here. And I will go back to the site plan for you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I have the speaker now, please, Jason Law? You have three minutes, Jason. Oh, Properties, please. Yeah. That one there. Perfect. Uh, committee, thank That's you it. for allowing me time today to speak to you. Uh, some matters I'd like to be considered. Um, as been pointed out by the case officer, this is a full application for a new dwelling due to the nature of the site and how it's been developed. Normally, we'd pursue something like this under a variation of condition, but it's come as a, a full application, which then gives the parish, you know, the full rights to come against us and say, this, this building's too big and da da da. The footprint's there, pretty much established. Um, oh, one quick thing, Chairman and Committee. I didn't design these. I've uh, just been brought in to sort out and refine some of the smaller points on them. Um, so when we went for this extension, I deliberately wanted that photo up because of the impact of neighbours. The neighbours didn't have that single storey extension there until they put in planning application for a single storey extension of the same height, closer to our boundary than the one we are proposing. The one we are proposing is in line with the original footprint of the house. So technically is a rear extension, not a side extension. And you might know where I'm going with this. Under permitted development rights, if I build the house, I'll be able to extend out of the back where I have indicated on the footprint. We had to address this because the house is not built. Mm -hmm. I'm here today to sort of propose that what's the sense in my client building a house and then at extra cost disrupting that house and infilling what they're entitled to under permitted development rights. So that's why we're here today. The case officer also pointed out another consideration that needs to be taken, and that's overlooking in privacy. House 7 has a balcony approved with external staircase, so very close proximity to 6. We, we detailed it, had it approved. House 7 has exactly the same. It's roof terrace. Lots of these houses on this elevation, on this side of the development site, um, have the potential for flat roof extensions with terraces above them. These have been exploited. Um, house seven is very close to the borders of, no, house eight is very close to the borders of seven and nine. Being approved, external staircase. We understood number 11's comments. We've taken away the staircase. There's no intention of this of being a party terrace. So now the access is going to be via a bedroom, not from the garden. We listened to that. We've taken the staircase away. Happy with that. The uniqueness of block 12 is it's on the southwest corner. Anyone who lives around here will know our western skies in the evenings are rather glorious. And if you could take the advantage of that, wouldn't you? Technically, we have an, a neighbour to the east, which is number 11, who has extended an infill to the side of their property closer than ours, with a larger extension than ours. To the north, the south and the west, we have no neighbours. And we have an unenviable position to really enjoy that terrace. Uh, and as I say, a terrace that has precedent on site with two others approved due to clever detailing. Thank you. Thank you. Anything to add, Olivia? No. Thank no. You. Right, members, anybody wish you got a comment? Councillor Bob and Long? Thank you, Chair. Um, this is in my ward, so yeah. I know it quite well. Um, I spoke up for this development around the pond when the parish council were a bit iffy about it. I must say, um, 
somewhat disappointed with what's being built so far. This is a much more interesting looking building, a bit like its neighbour. So from that point of view, I'm pleased to see that it's, that it's what is discussed, what is offered is better looking than some what's there. However, the parish council, um, whilst admitting that the, the, the balcony is going to have glazed ends, which you can't see through, is worried about the light pollution to the woods, which are effectively behind this and the other buildings. Um, in the winter, it's just bare twigs, so it's not going to reflect much. When the leaves are on the trees, all the light from these vast windows on, on the back are going to make quite an impact on people living around there. There's virtually no street lighting apart from a couple of bollards there, so it's going to show up. Um, so I'm in a bit of a quandary on this one. I like what's proposed, but I, I also agree with the parish council. So I think I'm going to have to abstain on this one and, and, and leave it to the rest of you. Right, thank you. Councillor Long then, and then parish. Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chairman. I don't see a problem with this whatsoever. There is already character and form in the locality of properties with balconies. I wouldn't have had any problem whatsoever with whether there was a staircase to a balcony. Mm -hmm. Actually, when you're looking at three-storey dwellings, an additional means of fire escape from upstairs rooms is actually a sensible addition. And uh, mm -hmm. I think if a, if a place was on fire and you got out onto the uh, balcony, you'd have wished you'd have put that staircase in. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't know that you could add a staircase under PD anyway, but really don't have a, a problem with it. I, I literally drove by there very recently mm -hmm. uh, and actually thought how, what a nice addition it made mm -hmm. to the village uh, and and um, some very interesting houses and I think this will be a, a welcome addition to that estate. Council Parish? Well, we may not be buddies again. Are, are you going to fall out? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the error... The error that was made, I suppose, is that when we agreed this development, and I remember it well, when we agreed a particular form and uh, layout of this development with gaps between houses and so on, um, we should have removed permitted development rights because obviously people have jumped on the bandwagon and started infilling every bit of space they can possibly infill, which was not the original intention of this um, little estate. Um, as far as the extensive glass is concerned, and the, the, the concern is about... Uh, not just light spill, but birds and bats flying into it, which does occur all along the coast where people have these extensive glass things. In the past, we have conditioned the type of glass to um, stop the incursion, excursion of light from the property and maybe reduce the re reflectivity to avoid um, bird impacts. So we've done that along the coast, so we could do it here. You said could. Are you asking? Yes, I'm asking for it. Right. Stuart. Problem, problem is you're singling out this one property for that. And I think that, that to me doesn't seem, seem right. And again, is it necessary? Would you refuse the application without that? I don't think I've seen any evidence that we would. No. So, so that's my, my, my own concern on, on that. Particular. I'm not asking you to refuse the application because of that. I'm saying, can we have that as a condition? That's the test of a condition. Would you refuse it without that condition? That, that, is, that, that is one of the tests of a condition. And is it fair and reasonable? And that's another one. Mm -hmm. that's yes. Another test as well. Yeah. Another test. Oh, yeah. Right. Well, anyway, members. Oh, Martin. you agree. Cast story. Have you yes, got a new point? It, well, I, I'd just like to see the street scene. Have we got a picture of the street scene up there, please? Um, yeah. That's, that's, to be fair, Madam Chairman. With the size and the design of the properties in and around that area, um, I haven't got any problem with this at all, Madam Chair. I think that would probably add to the form and character of that piece of land or that area just there. <laughs> I, I ain't got no trouble with that, Chair. It will finish it off, and like that, like it says, it's common sense to have it built all together. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm now going to take you then to the recommendation. Sorry, Councillor arrived. Just one question. Um, I get the sense that the other properties in, in this area also have extensions and the balconies. They've done on PD rights. Mm. Some of them might even have had it come in as well. But each case is on its merit. So, Olivia, just turn, turn yours off public and that speaker. the public speaker off. Yours and yours. Well, yeah, I think I'm working. So. 
balconies and terrace areas can't cannot be built under permitted development so they would have to put an application in for this but it's the ground floor extension to the rear element which could you could build an extension under permitted development not necessarily to the size this application is proposing but you could do so that's why i think the agent has said that they would rather have everything yeah. agreed under one application and then coming back and doing bits in different yeah. parts Right, members. But then, in which case, I'm now taking to the recommendation to approve. Wendy, please. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bauer. Four. Councillor Bub. Stay. Councillor Holmes. Four. Councillor Howland. Four. Councillor Hudson. Four. Councillor Lawton. Four. Councillor Manning. Four. Councillor Knuckles. Four. Councillor Parrish. Abstain. Councillor Mrs. Spiking. Four. Councillor Story. Four. Councillor Tyler. Four. Councillor Diwali. Four. Councillor Whitby. Four. Councillor Long. Four. Councillor Rose. Four. Councillor Rides. That's Carrie Chairman. Right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Page 153 next. There's late correspondence and a speaker. And it's a construction of two dwellings, new ones, following demolition of the right. existing. A full application, the recommendation is approved. Right. Jade, Jade hello. Thank you. Um, so this application... Um, relates to Lombardy, which is a two-storey detached dwelling situated on the northern side of High Street in Thornham. Um, there is a location plan on page 151 and 152 of your agendas. Um, the application seeks consent for the construction of two dwellings following demolition of the existing dwelling. Um, during the course of the application, negotiations have taken place where the applicant has compromised um, on the scale, footprint um, and design of the proposed dwellings so that they better relate to the character of the area and um, have regard for the non-designated heritage asset that is here, West End Cottages, um, and have better regard for the conservation area. Um, as you can see, this original submission, um, the footprints were quite large. Um, they didn't necessarily retain the sense of spaciousness um, or relate well to the, to the non-des. So this is the original submission for plot one. Um, it had kind of wider gables. Um, the proportions weren't traditional, like most of the, or the established form and character of the area. Um, the windows weren't sympathetic to, to the local character. <clears throat> and um, there was an overhanging timber cladded gable to the frontage, which would have appeared as an alien feature within the street scene. Plot two, as you can see, was quite excessive in scale and mass um, with significant width and depth. Um, and I think that the, the roof form being hit emphasised the overall bulk. <clears throat> so this is the revised block plan. Um, you can see that the footprints have been reduced. Um, the plot two has been pulled away from the northern boundary slightly to retain more space around the dwelling. Plot one has had the front gable removed and has the um, been reduced in footprint also and has better regard for the non-designated territory asset. set. Um, also, just going back, the, um, the access, they're utilising the existing access and um, a new driveway will be constructed to the eastern side of the site to serve plot two. So plot one, the revised um, plan, shows better proportions, more traditional portions with reduced gable widths, um, and reduced gable heights, better balance of fenestration. Plot two, again, has been significantly reduced in overall scale and bulk. The roof form is much more simplified. The pitched roof, balanced fenestration, smaller gable widths, and um, the gables have been reduced in height 
to be more subservient to the main dwelling. Um, both dwellings will be constructed um, of red brick, flint, red pantal, and a small amount of timber cladding. So going to the photos, this is Lombardi. As you can see, it is of no architectural merit and has limited value to the, uh, to the conservation area. Um, that's looking east towards the non-designated territories asset here, West End Cottages. Um, and again, West End Cottages. That's um, the other property, West Hat Hatch Cottage, which is um, to the northeast between Lombardy and West End Cottages. That's the other side of the site to the west, its neighbour Marmalade Cottage. Again, Marmalade Cottage. This is the rear of the site. Um, this is the rear side um, with the view down the eastern boundary, which is where the new access track will be located. And you can see West End Cottages there in the background. Um, the rear of the site again, but facing west, you can see the neighboring, right. the neighboring properties here. Uh, moving round towards the northwest um, boundary, this is um, an existing commercial caravan site to the north, round to the northeast. That's a neighbouring dwelling, West End House, around towards West Hatch Cottage again. And this just shows a wider view of the eastern boundary. <clears throat> Going to the street scene, you can see Lombardy there with Marmalade Cottage and the non designated territory assets there. Um, a wider street scene, just to show it in context. So the new access track will go along the eastern side. Um, and again, just looking towards West End Cottages and a view from West End Cottages, looking back towards the site in here. That's, I think that might be Marmalade Cottage there. Yeah. Um, and a wider view. So the development will be in, the, the second house will be in the back here. Um, so the application is recommended for approval. Um, it was called into planning committee by Council Lawton, uh, and the issues are on page 153 of your agendas. Thank you. Thank you. Could I have Sam Jones, please? Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you to the chair, to committee members and to council officers for visiting our site uh, last week and for your time and considering our proposals this afternoon. Um, I appreciate we are last on the agenda of what's been a long day, so I uh, feel well, you've got... Well, they're still keen, don't worry. <laughs> so I, I won't, take up, uh, won't take too much of your time. Um, the application before you is for the development of two new homes uh, following the demolition of Lombardy House on High Street in Thornham. And the site lies within the settlement development limits of Thorman um, in both the adopted neighbourhood and local plans. Do you know, you don't <laughs> learn this. That's all right. We'll start it again. That's really poor. Uh, I won't ask what two yellows mean. But, uh, <laughs> We're going to start it again. We're going to start you again. As... Right. Right. If you go out, you won't take part in the debate. <laughs> or else put it out the window. <laughs> You're fine. You're fine. It's never good. <laughs> right. I'm so, I do apologise. Oh. We'll start again. I carry on from where I set off. No, to say you start sure. again because we're timing you. So okay. we have to get it right. Fine. So right. thank you all again for your time last week and considering it uh, today. Um, the application before you is for the development of two new homes uh, following the demolition of Lombardy House on High Street in Thornham. Uh, and the site lies within the settlement development limit of Thornham in both the adopted uh, neighbourhood plan and your local plan. Um, the proposals before you have been subject to detailed discussions with your officers uh, and a range of specialist reports have been prepared, uh, reviewed and submitted by various consultees. Uh, there are no technical objections before you today for the development and we do concur with your officer's position that the proposed development is now in keeping with the established context and character of the area. Picture. Furthermore, it, it's our own view that demolition of the existing home on site, which has little architectural merit uh, and the replacement of two new 
high quality, bespokely designed homes will add value to the village's conservation area. And as you'll read, uh, as you'll have read in your officer's report, conservation team have raised no objections to our latest plans. Um, the case officer's report does highlight that following the submission of our latest designs, only one person has objected to elements of this application. No. Uh, and whilst no. this is one more than we would have liked, we do feel uh, that that's a strong indicator that there's little public objection to the scheme. Um, whilst I appreciate it's not a planning matter, um, the driver for this application is to build uh, ourselves a family home in the village, and we very much want to become part of the community in Thornham. Um, as such, it was important to us that we engaged with local residents and um, we met with members of the parish council early in our design stage to take on board their feedback for what they would like to see in new homes in this area of the village. And following those meetings, we set about designing a scheme that would deliver a small number of homes that are limited to two stories in height, uh, are built uh, in materials in keeping with the local vernacular, uh, and provide ample parking and respect their local dark skies policy. And we feel the scheme before you today achieves those things. And we're, we're delighted to kind of sit here today with the application having the full support of the parish council and their formal response to the planning authority concluded that the proposed scale of dwellings are appropriate in this part of the village and that the development is in the general interest of the village and should be supported. Uh, to conclude, um, we've endeavoured to design a small, high quality development that will be a credit to the village and no statutory consultees have objections to the scheme and it has the full support of the parish council and your planning officers. As such, I respectfully request the members approve the application in line with your officer's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Anything to add, Olivia? No, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I've got a question, please. The back gables on plot two, what exactly are those rooms that I see with those narrow windows? Um, bathrooms. Or oh, both bathrooms. Yeah, the narrow windows are bathroom. Well, an ensuite and a bathroom. Oh, that's fair enough. Mm. Thank you. I'd like that clarified. Right, Councillor Lawton. Yeah, this is in my board. Um, if you wish to go out and look at Lombardy, which I did, that's a horrible place mm -hmm. built in the sixties, I think, and the new buildings will be a vast improvement. On what's there. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm all for it. Thank you. Right, Councillor Parish. Yes, I've got um, nothing against them in particular. Um, I, I like the um, last speaker, that's the person who wants to build these houses. He spoke very well. Um, Having seen how what went on in the last application with permitted development rights, um, could we remove permitted development rights from these two buildings yeah. on the grounds that um, they can be sold on in the future and things can be done to them that we don't necessarily approve of? And permitted development rights removal doesn't stop people doing things to their houses, but it means they have to come back to um, planning officers and planning committee in order to get approved. What? If you look at condition 12 and 13, you'll find it's already done. Right. Thank you. Yes. Well noted. So I was thinking the same as the planning officers. No. Well, anyway, members, nothing else to add. I need to amend condition nine, members. Okay. Agreed. As in the late. So then the recommendation to approve, including amended nine, please, Wendy. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Bauer. Four. Councillor Bubb. Four. Councillor Holmes. Four. Councillor Howland. Four. Councillor Hudson. Four. Councillor Lawton. Four. Councillor Manning. Four. Councillor Knuckles. Four. Councillor Parrish. Four. Councillor Mrs. Spiking. Four. Councillor Story. Four. Councillor Tyler. Four. Councillor Diwali. Four. Councillor Whitby. Four. Councillor Long. Four. Councillor Rose. Four. And Councillor Rives. That's carried for approval, Chairman. Thank, Thank you. you very much. And then lastly, on page 169, applications determined under delegated. We note that report, members. Okay. Agreed. And then, Wendy, could you ask YouTube to be turned off, please? 
Georgia, could you please stop the live stream and confirm that we're no longer live on YouTube? Thank you. Right, members, with a bit of forbearance, I'm going to do something that I feel's. Could we have?